the committee will come to order. Uh, the subcommittee will come to order. Welcome ranking member Marchant, members of the subcommittee and hearing witnesses, and all of those in attendance. Welcome to the Federal Workforce Postal Service and the District of Columbia subcommittee hearing on advancements and continued challenges in the parole supervisor release and revocation of DC code offenders. The hearing will examine how the National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act of 1997 is being implemented with respect to the district's parole, supervised release, and revocation systems. We will seek to determine whether the changes made have been positive and whether additional changes are warranted. Hearing no objection, the chair, ranking member, and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. And so I say to all of you, good afternoon. Welcome to today's hearing to examine the advancements and challenges in the parole supervised release and revocation of D.C. code offenders post-enactment of the National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act of 1997 often referred to as the Revitalization Act. As many of us here today are aware, policymakers are working to find solutions and the means for improving the transition of ex-offenders back into society, thereby enhancing public safety. It is an issue that had long been ignored, but in recent years has received increased public and congressional attention. In fact, just recently, the Pew Center on the States issued a report on the nation's alarmingly high incarceration rates and found that more than one in 100 adult Americans are in jail or prison, which is an all-time high. The report also discovered that one in nine black men age 20 to 34 is behind bars, and black women age 35 to 39. The figure is one in 100. Compared with one in 355 for white women in the same age group. Clearly, we have a great deal of work ahead of us in this policy area. Ensuring the successful transition from confinement to community has long been a chief policy concern of mine, which is why I have been pushing so hard for consideration and passage of my bill, H.R. 1593, the Second Chance Act. This piece of legislation would promote ex-offender reentry reforms by employing a comprehensive government-led approach to eliminating barriers to reintegration for those coming out of prison and increasing access to critical transitional services for ex-offenders. The goal behind the Second Chance Act is to close the revolving door of ex-offenders going in and out of incarceration by providing additional funding opportunities that would assist with mentoring and housing. It is my hope that the Second Chance Act will become law soon so that we can begin to deliver to communities and cities such as the District of Columbia, the additional resources they need to support the successful reentry of ex-offenders. Since adoption of the Revitalization Act and the massive restructuring of DC's criminal justice system, a host of new policies, procedures, programs, and partnerships have been developed for the purpose of improving public safety in the District of Columbia. The Revitalization Act sought to reduce recidivism among D.C. code offenders and enhance the city's strategies for increasing public safety. Ten years after enactment of the Revitalization Act, the district now serves as an example for countless other localities grappling with implementing effective felon reentry systems and practices. The ex-offenders in the District of Columbia, like ex-offenders throughout the nation, face major barriers such as poor physical and mental health, homelessness, lack of education or employment opportunities, drug and alcohol 
dependency and in their transition from prison to society. These conditions often result in ex-offenders being re-arrested or having their parole or supervised release revoked, the very outcome that we're fighting to prevent. It is estimated that every year nearly 2,500 ex-offenders return to the district after completing their sentences. This is an average of five ex-offenders per day. Further, it is believed that as many as 60,000 D.C. residents are felons. Although these statistics may be somewhat disheartening, what is encouraging are the persons, organizations, and government agencies that work around the clock to assist the ex-offender population with their re-entry into society. It is my hope that today's hearing will provide us an opportunity to discuss the current challenges and solutions to offender re-entry in the district. Today's hearing will also examine the progress Rivers Correctional Institution has made in implementing pre-release programs and two pending legislative measures pertaining to the D.C. courts and the administration of judicial proceedings. I'd like to thank my colleague, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, for her tireless work in this policy area. And I ask unanimous consent that the statements of the Council for Court Excellence, Philip uh, Fornesi of the D.C. Prisoner Project, and the statement of Tanae Teen Dolphin, Chief of Staff to Mayor Adrian Fenty, be entered into the record. I thank you all and look forward to hearing testimony from today's witnesses. And now I'd like to yield to the ranking member of this subcommittee, the Honorable Mr. Marchant. Thank you, Chairman Davis. Thank you for holding this hearing today on the status of the offender supervision program in the District of Columbia. Ten years ago, as part of the National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act, the federal government assumed control over the District of Columbia's court and criminal justice systems. Too often, Congress enacts legislation but then never takes the time to assess whether the legislation actually had a beneficial impact on the issue it was enacted to resolve. Therefore, I applaud the chairman for taking the time to look at the progress made over the past decade to determine whether additional adjustments are necessary. It is important for this subcommittee to exercise its oversight of how the D.C. parole, supervised release, and revocation functions are working. All of our panelists today are in some form, in some way, on the front lines of our efforts to supervise offenders and reintegrate them back into our society. I look forward to hearing from each of the panelists and what they believe are some of the biggest challenges facing the district's criminal justice system. This information will hopefully help us ensure our offender supervisory programs and they, that they are effective as possible, both here and in the nation's capital, as well as the nation at large. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lincoln. Member uh, Representative uh, Norton, you have any comments? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank Chairman Danny Davis for his willingness to do continuing oversight of the transfer of an entire state prison system to the federal government's Bureau of Prisons. For the first time in U.S. history, federal jurisdiction of D.C. prison inmates, reentry services, and parole fit nicely with the chair's own path-breaking leadership on inmate reentry issues. Uh, Chairman Davis's uh, persistent and pioneering work as lead sponsor of the bipartisan <laughs> Second Chance Act, which I was pleased to co-sponsor, led to House passage in November. I have requested a continuing set of hearings that are particularly necessary now because the BOP the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency and the U.S. Patrol Commission, Parole Commission have been operating for a decade under the National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act of 1997 without the necessary and expected 
oversight from the Committee of Jurisdiction. Great deal is it's, a great deal is at stake. Beginning with what ex-offenders do with the rest of their often young lives, but much more as well. Big city crime is often fed by ex-offenders who come to prison from the most desperate and deprived layers of society and ironically may get their first chance in life behind prison bars or through a reentry program. Beyond the victims of crime, other victims quickly multiply to include especially the children and families of ex-offenders. Thus far, subcommittee staff, my staff and I have visited Rivers Correctional Institution uh, in Winston, North Carolina, and the BOP facility for men at Cumberland, Maryland. This spring, we will visit a facility housing DC female inmates and will seek the first hearing on DC women in BOP facilities. Perhaps the most difficult issue resulting from the transfer of local jurisdiction to federal authorities is the present location of 7,000 DC prisoners incredibly at 75 different facilities in 33 states, contrary to the intent of the Revitalization Act, which sought to afford close proximity of district prisoners to the district in keeping with undisputed penology. Prisoners who have not laid eyes on their relatives or children, uh, their minister or caring friends, return to civil society burdened and handicapped not only by absence but by distance, confounding successful reentry. I will shortly be presenting some ideas for corrective action to BOP officials and will seek to work with them toward a solution. The first hearing on DC inmates since transfer to federal authorities occurred in October, resulting from our initial investigation showing that DC prisoners did not always have access to services equal to those offered other inmates at BOP facilities. We appreciate the rapid response to the October hearing by BOP Director Harley Lappin and the important changes that have resulted. We welcome Rivers Warden George Snyder, who will testify today concerning the status of the issues addressed at that hearing, particularly the creation of a state-of-the-art drug rehabilitation program uh, coming to Rivers patterned on the well-regarded program available at BOP facilities and new job-related training programs. However, the goals, however, with the goals of the first hearing for DC prisoners behind bars in sight, the major purpose of today's hearing is to review federal policy and responsibility upon release for, for ex-offenders. We seek answers to a number of troubling questions. For example, do DC prisoners serve longer sentences for comparable crimes than prisoners elsewhere in the United States? If so, why and are such sentences justified? Are there specific standards for sending a parolee back to prison by revoking parole, such as the nature of the offense, current uh, employment, payment of child support, and the like. What is the purpose of denying credit for so-called street time or time spent after release without infractions? What is the effect of parole revocation for minor infractions on employment of the ex-offender? Does the U.S. Parole Commission operate on a zero tolerance policy, even for minor infractions? And if so, under what statutory authority? 
Have the parole revocation policies of the Parole Commission had the appropriate deterrent effect? Or is this policy counterproductive? Were the policies now in use intended by the Revitalization Act of 1997? Are such policies in keeping with the considerable investment federal taxpayers make in SOSA to facilitate reentry or in inmates themselves who participate in the best job training and drug rehabilitation services offered by any prison system in the world with the goal of preventing recidivism. In short, are these policies in the best interest of the District of Columbia, of District of Columbia residents, of inmates, of their families? Whom do they serve? We look forward to the testimony of U.S. Parole Commissioner Isaac Fulward, Jr., former Metropolitan Police Department Chief, for the considerable insights and experiences he brings to the issues before us today. We welcome Tyrone Brown, an ex-offender who got his GED while incarcerated, remained crime-free, but was returned to prison while on parole for minor infractions and as a result lost his street time. I ask unanimous consent also to receive the testimony of Anthony Cunningham, a barber who had the benefit of a new alternative system of sanctions instead of being reincarcerated. Paul Kwanda, Director Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency. Avis Buchanan, Director Public Defender Services for the District of Columbia and James Austin, an expert on D.C. prison and parole issues, who will present findings from a report addressing the matters at issue. We also are pleased to receive testimony from Chief Judge Rufus King concerning a bill to increase the number of Superior Court judges, as well as Betty Balster Esquire regarding an increase in the hourly rates of lawyers who are appointed by the Superior Court to represent indigent defendants. I, I very much appreciate uh, the graciousness of the chair in moving forward with yet another hearing on these issues. Thank you, uh, Delegate Norton, and without objection, Mr. Cunningham would be permitted to testify and his testimony entered into the record. Um, Mr. Cummins, you. Mr. Chairman, I'll submit my uh, statement, opening statement, uh, in writing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummins. Then we'd like to ask if our first panel would be seated, uh, Mr. Tyrone Brown and Mr. Anthony Cunningham. <laughs> Mr. Tyrone Brown is a 20, you may be seated. Mr. Tyrone Brown is a 23-year-old DC code offender who recently returned to the community after having his parole revoked. While incarcerated, Mr. Brown was able to earn his GED as well as obtain a professional plumbing certificate. Tyrone is currently employed and is a resident of the Hope Village Residential Reentry Center. Welcome, Mr. Brown. Thank you very much. Mr. Anthony Cunningham is a licensed barber in the District of Columbia and a DC code offender. Mr. Cunningham would have had his parole revoked and lost credit for his street time over a minor infraction. Instead, he participated in an alternative system involving reprimand sanctions that kept him from being returned to prison. Gentlemen, let me thank both of you. It is the uh, policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn in so if you would join me in standing and raise your right hand, uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, gentlemen, your entire statement is already included in the record. Uh, we ask that you take five minutes and summarize what you have to say 
the green light that's there is an indicator of the time. The green light indicates that you've got five minutes, and when it gets down to yellow, that indicates that you've got a minute left, and then we ask you to summarize and sum up. And then, of course, the red light means the same as the red light, I guess, out on the street that you're supposed to stop. So thank you very much, and we're delighted that you're here, and we'll begin with Mr. Brown. Sums, what I just sum. Okay. Um, as far as the we'll then have it as far as the, um on parole, um, well, I think I've been, I've been, I made parole 2003, and um, from 2003 to, to now, I was set back for a violation, minor violations. Um, my street time was taken. Every time I violated, I was working and had my own place. They took that, you know, they just snatched all that from me. Um, I feel as though it's, just, it's, it's like a, a triple jeopardy, you know, because while they're taking our street time, it's like we'll never get off, get off parole. It just constantly go up. And um, I feel as though that ain't right. Far as um, rivers, rivers, they got a nice, they got a lot of programs at rivers, but it ain't going to do nothing for nobody that's like me that's already got a GED. And some of the programs, they it's it's more like you got to fit a criteria to get it. Like they got a, a HVAC class up there. Um, I think it was 18 or 24. You, you got it, that's the only way you could get in. I'm like, I'm 30, 31, 32. So that was like a bomber right there. Um, far as replication hearings, um, when you're going in front of them, which you, you're saying that you got a job, you got a place, you don't wanna lose this. All right, I caught a dirty yawn, but is there another way of, you know, trying to correct the solution. And I don't think doing, giving us jail time going change nothing. You know, I mean, we got a, I got an addiction. It's a disease. Jail time shouldn't, you know, be the solution of it. We should find another way of, of going because people got family, jobs. I understand I, I, I violated, but it's it got to be a better way. I think so, but um, that's basically it, what I got to say. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have some questions after Mr. Cunningham finishes. Mr. Cunningham, you might begin. Uh, how you doing? Well, I remember my first time ever being incarcerated. Um, Why don't you pull that up a little bit and make sure that, push that button and make sure it's on. Um, I remember the first time that I was incarcerated, and that was back in 1985. Um, back then, they had a lot of programs where you were able to go to to get all the benefits that you really wanted. It. Um, that's how I got my first barber license, I've been in Youth Center 1. During the previous time, come out, I was doing good after doing my two-year sentence. Um, I went straight from 2000 and, I mean, 97, 87, all the way to 2001, I committed another crime and was real estate back and incarcerated. And the last time I remember that, you know, do I continue wanting to do the things I used to do? So after doing a three-year sentence of 2001, 
I came home, got back on the right path and doing the things that I needed, really needed to do at that particular time. Um, the program, when I went back out and did something I had no business doing and I was, you know, getting back, getting high, instead of them sending me back to prison, they sent me to a program and I was an um, outpatient and I had to go to there. So the program was a really good program and it helped me. It made me realize some of the things I really wanted to do. If you really into that program, you really have to want it and not be, you know, a person that think that you can do what you really wanted to do. Um, I'm a little kind of nervous, so excuse me. Oh, that's all right. We all are. Yeah. Um, the program is a really good program. They also have an after program where you go into a patient, um, inside patient program if they feel that you are not ready. The program um, really helps you out. It really gives you the good benefit to get back on the right track, and it also helped me. I was just on the edge of losing my job, being back incarcerated, and not able to do the things I needed to do for my kid. So that was the most important thing to me. And I realized, you know, after the death of my grandmother and my grandfather, it was just like a shock of me. You know, so I had to do something way different from the things I used to do back in the past. All right, well, thank you both. Thank you very much. Um, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Brown, what, what was you incarcerated for? Um, I was incarcerated for aggravated assault, 2000, May 1997. And how long were you incarcerated? Um, five years. And what was done to help you while you were in prison? Um, of course, through the five years, I was um, I ended uh, my anger management programs. Um, several of them, and. Like I said, they had G GED programs, and I got my GED while I was in. So, how far did you go in regular high school? Um, seventh grade. So you dropped out at seventh grade. And I passed to the eighth, never went. You passed to the eighth and never went. Um, what caused you, if you remember, to Excuse me. drop out at that point? Um. I was like, I was running the streets. Um, was it 14, 13, 14? Yeah, th 13, 14, yeah. running the streets. Um, I, was, I was in and out of foster um, care. Um, yeah, just hanging around, just hanging out in the streets. Mm -hmm. Did the anger management help you any, would you say that the anger management assistance that you got while incarcerated helped you? Yes. Um, they, it, it, it taught me how to, um, you know, you know, settle differences without violence, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's, it's, it's more like, it's better ways than this violence, you know, so. It helped me a lot. Then they had a cage of rage, so I went through a few of them. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to hear, would you recommend that as a way of helping individuals, especially those individuals who may have um, gotten into altercations and yes. that's why they ended up incarcerated? Yes. Was there any other infractions that you committed, or was it just that? Uh, um, that's that was my only um, charge. That's why I'm on parole. Um, far as when I was uh, parole, 2003, 
or my uh, I never caught another charge. How long did it take you to get your GED? Um, it took me when I when I was in Memphis, Tennessee. It took me like six months to get my GED. And so you dropped out of high school. Well, you never went to high I school. I never went. But you dropped out in eighth grade. Yes. And you were able to get a GED in a few months. Yes. Always I mean, was smart, you know, but yeah, I was just. That's, <laughs> that's, that's. I just made the wrong choices. That's quite <laughs> smart, to be fair. I mean, to be able to actually do a GED, yeah. not having done it in high school, and yeah. just kind of being yeah. out on the streets and that kind of thing. I used to teach GED. Yes. So I, I know a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and now you have license to. Uh, plumber. You, you, you plumber. License plumber, yes. Oh, that's fantastic. So actually, you've been helped by yes. some of these programs. Yes, right? yes. All right, so you, you, you would say that the programs have actually helped you. Yes, only if you want to help. All right. Yeah. Mr. Cunningham, let me ask you, how many children do you have? I had two kids. You have two kids? Yes. Married? No. No? But you still have a relationship and had a relationship with your children. Yes. I heard you indicate mm -hmm. that you wanted to be able to assist your children right. and help them. How would you say that the programs helped you while you were incarcerated? Well, I can say the program really helped me because that was a trade that I really liked to do, was to cut hair. Um, it helped me a lot. It helped me to learn that, to get along with other people and communicate. And you know, it, it does a very good job as that's what some people really like to do. Did you have any trouble getting your barber's license? Um, no, sir. You know, it's interesting that um, in my state, <laughs> until just recently, it was against the law. <laughs> for a person to get licensed even after they had gone through a training program mm -hmm. while in prison. It was still against the law. Oh, well, yeah. I still went to school when I got out. You know, I still had to do the hours um, in Blainsbury, and then I got my license and transferred over to D.C. Well, let me just congratulate both of you, and uh, I'll stop at this point and... Uh, Ask Mr. Marchant if he's got questions. Uh, thank you both for coming today and, and speaking to us. Is there anything that you would like to bring to the committee's attention as a suggestion that could have improved um, your training? Uh, anything in the system that you found uh, was over burdensome to you and difficulties that you had in your rehabilitation? Mr. Brown. Um, well, I mean, when I was in, the only burden was the, the means of money like a lot of people don't have family that could send them money and the, the, they pay you hourly like 12 cents an hour so and I'm just I feel as though when I was at Rivers you can take up correspondence classes but if you don't have the means of money to getting it and they don't have that much, you know, 12 cent an hour, it's, it's like, you know, you barely paying for your soap. And, and it's, that's, that's, that's my only burden there. It just, they don't have the means of paying people to take care of themselves, whereas though, I might not have nobody send me no money or look after me. I got to look out for myself. 
And um, that alone brings conflict in the institution. Um, that's all I got to say. Okay. Mr. Cunningham? Um, I agree with what he's saying. Um, they do need more program that can keep each and each and individual inmate on the right track because as long as there's no program for them to do something to rehabilitate them when they get on the outside or to the society, nine out of 10, a lot of them wind up back doing the same thing they normally used to do. So a lot of program when I was in, we had a lot of program going on. Now it's just like a lot of programs been taken for them to rehabilitate themselves, able to get the job, the benefit for themselves, so they're able to be on the right track. If they can get that, I believe possibly that something can work out better for each and every one of them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Marchant. Uh, Ms. Norton. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And <clears throat> I want to thank Mr. Brown and Mr. Cunningham for coming forward for your candor, for your courage. Um, perhaps there are people who could come to testify about you. Your firsthand testimony is extremely valuable to us, particularly given what I understand are quite different circumstances. You each faced once there was a parole violation. Now, the nature of your parole violation, Mr. Brown, was that a dirty urine? Yes, and um, um, not, not going to see my parole officer. All right, uh, and that was for marijuana? Yes. All right, Mr. Cunningham, what was the nature of your uh, parole violation? Uh, my parole violation was based on for me to go into an outpatient program. No. Y were, was your, your parole violation? Was for a dirty urine. Was for a dirty urine? Yes. All right. Now, Mr. Chairman, we have before us two young men. How old are you, Mr. Brown? 32. Mr. Cunningham? 40. Both uh, within the same relative age group. One gets sent back to prison probably before the alternative program Mr. Cunningham was able to take advantage of uh, was uh, used. Uh, Mr. Brown, when you were sent back, when, you, when your parole was revoked and you were sent back to prison. Yes. Uh, how long did, were you reincarcerated? How long did you serve that time? Um, 12 months. How much, how far gone was your parole before that? Now the parole, the amount of time you were under the supervision right. of the authorities. How much more time would you have had on parole? Um, uh, it was 2013. So you got no credit for the time you had already spent on the street? No. They took that and put it on the back number. Right. See, my original charge was 5 to 15. But every time I violate parole, they put it on the back number. And that, that just make the back number get bigger and bigger instead of getting smaller and smaller. Um, let me then contrast this with what happened to Mr. Cunningham. At the time that you also had a dirty, a dirty mm -hmm. excuse me, uh, urine, was it also for marijuana? Yes, ma'am. Um, what was the procedure you went through that resulted in your being sanctioned to go to a drug rehabilitation program. How did that work? 
Um, the program actually works, you know, they ask you questions, they ask you what's your drug of choice. Um, they ask you what would you benefit out of the program? What did you really want out of life? Uh, it's a lot of things they ask you, you know. Before deciding whether or not you would have alternative sanctions, sanctions other than going back to prison. Yes. And you satisfied the parole commission that the sanctions uh, were the better alternative for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, two. What was the year of the, what, what 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 were the, the, the what was the year of your violation? Um, the violation was because I was first time after four years of being clean, being on parole, I had one year left. And no, I, I mean before you got sanctioned, this this sanction, this alternative sanction. What was the year that they used this alternative sanction? Sent you to a, a drug rehabilitation program? Um, basically, I had to complete the sanction and stay away from the area that I used to be in. And what year was that, Mr. Cunningham? That was in 2007. Now, have, uh, Mr. Brown, when, what was the year you were sent back to prison? Um, 2004, I've been, I've been vi violated uh, parole three times. Um, but different infractions? Yes. Were any of these, did any of these infractions involve um, weapons? No, no. I, no, no new charge when I violated. It was just all marijuana charges. None of these dirty involved ons. a crime? No, nah, yeah. it was just dirty on. And um, when I went, to, when, I, when I seen the replication here, I asked them, you know, can I have a, a drug, an inpatient drug program? But all three times they denied it and say. Now had either of you got, had any kind of drug, rehab access to any kind of drug rehabilitation while you had been incarcerated? Um, no ma'am, I'm not, not while I was incarcerated. Boss, How about you Mr. Brown? The, the, uh, the 40 hour. 40, 40 hour. hour, which is the alternative to the 500 hour program exactly. that we're trying to exactly. get at Rivers. Yes. So you had had no state of the art drug rehabilitation program? No. Both of you are typical of uh, nonviolent offenders in the District of Columbia who are there uh, very often uh, for crimes related to drug offenses, obviously without some kind of, of program to help get rid of the uh, dependency before you're out, uh, the kind of dependency that you still had results. Uh, both of you, uh, Mr. Um, Brown went to the seventh grade but quickly got his GAD once he was in prison. That's what I mean by saying some people get their first chance behind bars. Yes. Uh, or at least realize what they can do behind bars. Mr. Cunningham, how about you? I completed school. Where, where, did, you all, where, I, I, where, where did you go to school, Mr. McKinley Tech. You went to McK McKinley. Um, you have children, Mr. Cunningham? Yes, ma'am. How about you, Mr. Brown? Excuse me? You have children? No, ma'am. Mr. Cunningham, you support your children? Yes. Um, I must say, Mr. Brown, you have <laughs> managed to get jobs. Now, Mr. Cunningham trained to be a barber, so he has a uh, skill that he can carry around. Uh, I was impressed by the fact that you have managed to get jobs when, in fact, we have, my office has a job fair every year, and one of the problems we find with ex-offenders who come is they have difficulty getting jobs. Did you have a job at the time uh, that this dirty Urim showed up? Excuse me? Were you employed at the time that you were reincarcerated yes. for having dirty Urim? Did anybody yes. ask you at the time, did, did anybody, whoever it was who sanctioned you to go back to prison, did they ask you if you had a job? Yes. Um, 
when you said you had a job, what was their response? Um, their response was when I when I when I asked them when I t asked them can I be put in a uh, drug program? Um, I got a job. I got a I got a apartment. If if I get locked up, I'm gonna lose all of it. And can we find a better solution? They were saying. They told me that some they think marijuana is not a habit forming drug. They think marijuana is not a habit forming drug. Yes. But they were going to send you to prison. For, we don't send people to prison for marijuana usually in this country. Well, that's what they that's <laughs> what they told me. I cannot get a drug drug treatment for marijuana. I see. I see what you're saying. It's not habit forming. I do see the circular nature of this exactly. reasoning. It's not habit forming, so you don't need drug treatment, so you go to Slammer instead. Okay. I yeah. Get it. Um, I, I understand from the interviews that have been done of you that you worked as a at Burger King. At yes. You worked um, Giant. You worked. I work Giant right now. How were you able to get these positions? What happened? Well, first, let me go back. When you lost your position because you were reincarcerated, yes. Were you able to get that job when you came back out? Um. No, no. How about your apartment that you said you had? Um. No, but I couldn't get that back. Um. I so lost you lost that. your apartment? Yes. And yeah. you lost your job? Yeah. So you had to get back up and get out and start looking for these jobs all over again. How did you manage to do to do that? Um, well, I was just I just did my full work in this, went to all different spots and, and applied. Say it again? I said I did my foot work and just went to every spot that they was hiring and um, applied online and um, kept calling them. You know, kept on calling them, kept calling them. And then one day they said, come on down. Uh, m Mr. Brown, you indicated that you were raised on foster care. Is that the case? Um, yeah. So yes. you were not raised by your own mother and father? Um, my father was deceased when I was an infant. Um, my mom, she was on drugs, you know, and she was bouncing the house to house. So. Yes, I was pretty much raised in a foster care. Who raised you, Mr. Cunningham? Uh, my grandmother, my grandfather. You were fortunate. Yes. Uh, um, where, where did you learn barbering? Was that at McKinley or did you? Excuse me? Did you learn barbering at McKinley? How did you get into barbering as a, as a profession? Yes. How? Mm. Did you, how did you get that training? What um, led you to that training? I started out when I was in um, U Center One. Then where? In U Center One. I'm sorry? U Center. It used to be a U Center. Are you center. center here in the District of Columbia? No, it was in Virginia. That Lawton. Was where all the people used to go down to Lawton there. I see. You and learned barbering there. I, I learned down there. And when I came home in like 87, I went to Blainsbury Barber School, and then I did my hours there and completed it, and that's how I got my license. Mr. Uh, Cunningham, what would have happened if instead of being sent, just a moment, was yours marijuana as well? Yes, ma'am. Well, but marijuana is not, marijuana is not habit forming, so how did you get access to, or at least that's what they told Mr. Brown, how did you get access to a drug rehabilitation program? Well, um, I can just say, I could just maybe look at it like, I, n I haven't gotten in trouble in four years since I was on parole, never had a dirty urine, so that was my first dirty urine. And it's like once you complete the phase, at a time you being in there, they take you off the urine. So it was just like one day I just wind up smoking some weed. And then they called me in to take a spot test. So I had a dirty urine. So I was still working, still doing the things that I needed to do, never gave 
my parole office no reason, you know, to send me back or, you know, to maybe give me a second chance. So that's how I wound up getting into the drug program. Well, I got news for the parole commission. <laughs> um, marijuana, according to potheads I have known, <laughs> is or can be habit forming. Um, but at least uh, with respect to you, somehow or the other, you had your sanction at a time when there was an alternative. Mr. Brown did not. We brought you both here because we're trying to uh, improve uh, the system, to do whatever we can to improve it, to see whether it's rooted in law, whether it's rooted in any kind of sane policy, whether anyone takes into account that you have a job, which is very difficult for a ex-offender to get in the first place, um, that you have a family, uh, if you will, a kind of cost-benefit analysis. Dirty urine for the kind of, of um, substance uh, that is routinely used out here by people who are never incarcerated or loss of a job and, that, and perhaps support mm -hmm. that others are, are dependent upon. Um, but the only way to know it is to have um, people like yourselves uh, come forward and tell us what it has been like. But Mr. Chairman, I very much appreciate the opportunity to hear and question these witnesses, and thank you. Thank you very much. And let me just ask one additional question. Um, was marijuana the only uh, substance that uh, was ever found in either one of your urines? Just marijuana. Pardon? Marijuana was the only one? Yes. And alcohol. Just alcohol and marijuana? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate you coming and sharing your experiences with us. And if you had anything else to write down and wanted to, or if you think of something that you'd like to have us know, just write it down and get it to us, and we'd be delighted to have it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you I will just go ahead and introduce our second panel. Uh, Mr. Paul Quandra, Director of Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency. Um, as Director of the Federal Agency Responsible for Ex-Offender Supervision, uh, Mr. Quandra is uh, the first director of the court services and offender supervision agency. It's called CSOSA, C. Sosa. He has served in this capacity since 2002. C. Sosa is responsible for supervising adults on probation, parole, and supervised release in the District of Columbia. Wanda, thank you so much and welcome. Chief Isaac Fullwood is the Commissioner of the United States Parole Commission. Commissioner Isaac Fullwood has service, served on the United States Parole Commission since being confirmed by the U.S. Senate on November the 2nd, November 20th, 2004. Chief Fullwood has distinguished himself as an outstanding law enforcement practitioner in the law enforcement community. He served 29 years as a member of the Metropolitan Police Department and became the district's 25th chief of police for the Metropolitan Police Department in 1981. Commissioner Fullwell, we thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. Ms. Avis E. Buchanan is the Director of Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia. Avis Buchanan has served as the director 
of the district's Public Defender Service, PDS, for the past three years. She holds a Juris Doctorate and has worked as a staff attorney for the Equal Employment Opportunity Project of the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. Dr. James Austin is president of the JFA Institute, um, which is a nonprofit research agency that works in concert with federal, state, and local government agencies and philanthropic foundations to evaluate criminal justice practices and design research-based policy solutions. Dr. Austin has over 25 years of experience in correctional planning and research and is the former director of the Institute on Crime, Justice, and Corrections at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Austin authored the study on the evaluation and revalidation of the U.S. Parole Guidelines Risk Instrument which is used to rate the suitability of parole for D.C. sentenced prisoners. Uh, thank you all so very much. We're delighted that you're here. And as the tradition of this committee, all witnesses are sworn in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah, yes. The record will show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. <coughs> uh, we thank you all for coming, and uh, you know that the light means that we've got five minutes of testimony. Your full testimony is in the record. We get down to the yellow light. We're really at one minute, and we'd like for you to begin to wrap up. The red light means that you've completed, and we'd like for you to stop so that we can get to the next witness, and then get to the questions. Thank you all for joining us, and Mr. Quandra, we'll begin with you. Thank you, Chairman Davis, and good afternoon, Chairman Davis and um, Congresswoman Norton. When the Revitalization Act created the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency in 1997, the District of Columbia's parole system was under investigation by the city's Inspector General. In 1995, a parolee murdered a young woman named Bettina Prockmeyer. Her case continues to underscore the reality that public safety is at the heart of community supervision. Citizens expect that we will closely monitor the offenders who reside among them, and it is our highest duty to remain deserving of that trust. In his report, D.C. Inspector General E. Barrett Prettyman identified the conditions that contributed to inadequate parole supervision. An average caseload of 179 offenders per officer in 1994 and 95, inconsistent application of drug testing and contact standards, and inadequate procedures to notify the releasing authority, then it was the D.C. Board of Parole, of violations or arrests. In his first year, C. Sosa focused on addressing these conditions. The agency received substantial resources to lower supervision caseloads. The general supervision caseload is now below the national, um, nationally rec recommended maximum of 50 offenders per officer, and specialized caseloads are significantly lower. We also put in place stringent contact standards and drug testing requirements. The average number of offenders tested each month uh, for drug uh, abuse has risen from 2,300 in 1999 to over 8,500 in fiscal year 2007. Since fiscal year 2003, the percentage of the supervised population who test positive at least once during the fiscal year has decreased by 10 percent to its current level of 46 percent. CSOSA also recognized the need to maintain an active, visible community presence to improve public confidence and collaboration with our law enforcement partners. To that end, we have established six field offices locating the majority of our officers in neighborhoods where offenders live and work. We conduct over 8,000 joint field visits or accountability tours with the Metropolitan Police Department every year. The message that police and community supervision officers communicate and collaborate to enforce accountability is reinforced daily on the streets of Washington. This message is further reinforced through extensive data sharing 
um, by way of both CSOSA's case management system and the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council's justice system. CSOSA works closely with the United States Parole Commission to ensure that parole and supervised releases are, um, conditions are as effective as possible. We create special conditions in coordination with the United States Parole Commission so that offenders participate in programs that will further their treatment and their reentry into the District of Columbia. Such conditions have been particularly important in implementing our newest resource, the Reentry and Sanctions Center. This is a 28-day residential program that provides intensive assessment and treatment readiness programming to high-risk offenders at the critical point of transition into the community. C. Sosa recognized early that the district's public treatment capacity could not provide the level of services needed for this population. To supplement that capacity, we asked and requested of this body and receive resources to develop additional contract treatment capacity. Last year, we made over 2,400 treatment placements for substance abuse treatment. The public has a right to expect um, that community supervision will detect and interrupt offenders' non-compliant behavior before it escalates to a new crime. To that end, CSOSA consistently monitors the risk level of offenders through initial and periodic assessments. We address non-compliance through a system of sanctions that are imposed quickly and uniformly. CSOSA's sanction matrix defines the appropriate response to each level of infraction based on the offender's supervision level and the nature of the violation. Sanctions options include written reprimands, attendance at daily sanctions groups, increased reporting, increased drug testing, community service, halfway back, and the reentry and sanction center. In fiscal year 2007, we sanctioned over 96 percent of the violations reported each month. We are always seeking to expand the range of sanctions available to community supervision officers. Since fiscal year 2004, we have placed more than 2,000 high-risk offenders on GPS monitoring. In 2006, we worked with the United States Parole Commission to implement reprimand sanctions hearings. Since the program began, 84 hearings have been held, and our early data indicate that these hearings improve compliance. Our day reporting and violence reduction program also target noncompliance among high-risk offenders with histories of violence. Through san though sanctions are a critical component of community supervision, they cannot always restore compliance. If noncompliance escalates to the point of being a public safety risk, a request for revocation must be the next step. In fiscal year 2006, CSOs or community supervision officers filed over 3,400 alleged violation reports with the United States Parole Commission. Three quarters of these cases were supervised at the maximum or intensive supervision level at the time of the AVR, which is the highest levels um, of supervision. Forty-six percent of the AVRs involved a new arrest and 54 percent were for non-compliant technical violations such as substance abuse, failure to report for their office visits or drug testing, non-compliance with program requirements or other violations of written requirements issued by the releasing authority. The average alleged violation report documented six violations. Three quarters of all violations were drug related. Ultimately, less than a third of the alleged violation reports resulted in the United States Parole Commission issuing a warrant. Community supervision will um, not constitute more than a brief hi hiatus between episodes and incarceration unless mechanisms are in place to address the factors that drive crime and noncompliance. In addition to substance abuse, these factors include unstable housing, unemployment, lack of education, and mental health issues. Offenders who cannot earn a living wage, find a place to live, improve their skills, or get treatment for their illnesses are more, are more likely to fall out of compliance. We work diligently with our public and nonprofit and faith-based partners to ensure that offenders have access to as many resources <laughs> as possible. Notwithstanding these efforts, more opportunities are needed, particularly in the areas of transitional housing, vocational training, and job placement. I thank you for the opportunity to appear um, before you today and will be happy to answer any and all questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Quander, and we will now proceed to uh, Chief Fullwood. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and to my Congresswoman Norton, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this timely discussion 10 years after the anniversary of the National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Act. As you know, when the act was implemented, it had two purposes in mind. 
to revitalize the economy of the District of Columbia and to improve the prospects for home rule. The major changes for the District of Columbia were the closing of the Lawton Complex, the transferring of, to the Federal Bureau of Prisons the responsibility for all D.C. felons sentenced to com confinement, the creation of the Court Service and Offender Supervision Agency, transferring funding of the D.C. court system, rewriting laws for D.C. which eliminated parole and required a fixed term of confinement, and abolishing of the D.C. Parole Board and transferring authority, authority to the United States Parole Commission. The question is, did the Revitalization Act help the city? In some respects, it's a mixed blessing. Today, the city is a better, in better shape financially with economic growth and a safer place. However, for the people who find themselves incarcerated in the Bureau of Prisons, their lives are compounded by being a long way from, from family and their inability to maintain contact with loved ones. Equally, the level of programming within the Bureau of Prisons to prepare the offender to successfully return to society is oftentimes inadequate. The challenge that the criminal justice system faces with an urban population of offenders due to the issue of drug abuse, crimes of violence, and pressure in the community to address order maintenance problems taxes the limits of its resources. In addition, this is a population that is disproportionately minority. This raises the issue of best approaches to supervision. What are the best practices for rehabilitation and building social support systems and strengthening family connections? The DC offender is a group that's up close, impacting our lives every day, and reducing the recidivism rate is important to the city as it focuses on continuing to make the city a safer place. To address these issues, there is a need to improve programming in the institution. GED, skill training such as Unicor, drug abuse training, family management. Most studies in recent times that speak on how to lower the recidivism rate speak on the need to improve programming in the institution so that the offender's population is better equipped to handle the pressures related to social control. The responsibility of the United States Parole Commission is to work with the criminal justice partners in managing the public safety, setting sanctions of relief, and estimating risks. We have jurisdiction over the following type of cases. All federal offenders who commit an offense before November the 1st, 1987, all DC code offenders, the Uniform Code of Military Justice offenders who are confined in the Bureau of Prison Institution and transfer treaty cases, uh, U.S. citizens convicted in foreign countries who would like to serve their time here, and state probationers and parolees in the Federal Witness Protection Program. Briefly, the goal of supervision is public safety, taking steps and actions to prevent offenders from intimidating the community, reducing recidivism, keeping the person in the community through coordination with our various partners, and the socialization, assisting the offender with transitioning back to the community and understanding his or her responsibility for appropriate behavior. The issue of setting sanctions for the U.S. Parole Commission is identifying risk factors. What are those issues that put the community at risk. Secondly, the use of technology, GPS, polygraphs, and high levels of supervision. Critical to the success of completing supervision is building support in the community and connecting to families. So to the issue of reentry, the problem that many uh, offenders face when they come back to the community, no transitional housing. And the impact is even greater now because of the changing demographics in the city of Washington, D.C. Very difficult to get housing. Uh, communities be have become very expensive. Drug treatment, job training, and socialization. Connection to family, mental health issues, developing partnerships to assist in reentry. The challenge that is faced by an urban population is the issue of managing offenders who suffer from drug abuse, unemployment, 
and poor social skills. CSOS and the U.S. Parole Commission have developed a, an approach, a pilot, called reprimand sanctions. And reprimand sanction is built on the concept of the district drug courts. Instead of judges, offenders stand before a parole commissioner. Briefly, let me discuss this program. The mission of reprimand sanction hearings serve as a graduated sanction, short of revocation, that permits the commission to address non-compliant behavior. The goal is to increase safety in the community and for the offender to advantage him or herself of program support, which will reduce the rate of recidivism. Additionally, it will restore a sense of respect to the offender. So the issue is approve accountability, reduce recidivism, reconnect the offender to supervision, identify support programs for offenders, and develop working partnerships with CSOSA, with the Public Defender Service, and the U.S. Parole Commission. In summary, let me first commend the Public Defender Service and CSOSA for the work towards improving the quality of life for offenders, which in the end makes us all a safer community. Today, there are still barriers to reentry a lack of community resources, limited housing, substance abuse, dual diagnosis programs, financial support, coordination, and need for high levels of supervision for some offenders. The act has produced a greater coordination of service for offenders in the DC community. This would include public, private, and faith-based organizations. There has also been a more concerted effort to better identify the risk and, and need each offender poses so that the strategy can be developed to address those issues. And finally, the act has created a more thoughtful, coordinated effort among the various partners in the criminal justice system within the District of Columbia. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Chief Fullwood. And uh, now we will go to uh, Attorney uh, Buchanan. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Congresswoman Norton. I am Avis Buchanan, Director of the D.C. Public Defender Service. Thank you for this invitation to testify before the subcommittee today on parole, supervised release, and revocation of D.C. Code offenders. PDS is a federally funded, independent, local public defender office. PDS has represented over 90 percent of the thousands of D.C. code offenders facing parole or supervised release revocation by the United States Parole Commission. Since the Revitalization Act of 1997 abolished the D.C. Board of Parole and transferred authority over D.C. parolees and supervisees to the Commission, PDS has seen an increase in the number of supervision revocations, a profound increase in the number of revocations based on minor violations, an increase in the length of time offenders are serving for violations, and an increasing lack of transparency in the revocation process. In 2006, at least 2,000 revocation hearings were held for D.C. parolees out of a total parole and supervised release population of approximately 5,400. Most hearings resulted in parole being revoked and a prison sentence of at least one year being imposed. The D.C. Code offender faces several challenges in the revocation process. In the district, the majority of persons in the, commis the, pr the commission finds have violated their parole and sends back to prison are returned for technical violations only, such as failure to maintain employment. In fiscal year 2007, 20 percent of D.C. Code offenders on parole or supervised release had their parole or supervised release revoked because of technical violations only. Compared with the Commission, judges are much more amenable to alternatives to incarceration and more likely to accept the recommendation of the supervision officer to continue the person under supervision with additional conditions, as the Commission does not. We therefore propose that authority for revocation decisions be transferred from the Commission to the Superior Court judges who imposed the original sentence. The Commission's decades-old salient factor scoring system, used to determine a parolee's likelihood of recidivism and the penalty to be imposed, one, skews toward reincarceration and then toward lengthy prison sentences. Two, as found by a recently published report commissioned by the District's Criminal Justice Coordinating Council in cooperation with the Commission, entitled Evaluation and Revalidation of the U.S. Parole Guidelines Risk Instrument, does not account for factors and behaviors that have shown to affect and or predict recidivism. And three, 
as the system was designed for use in initial parole grant matters, it fails to adjust for some of the obvious differences between inmates seeking parole and parolees facing revocation. While the Commission accepted the report's recommendations that the Commission review its salient factor score system, allow for much shorter periods of incarceration, and consider not reincarcerating low risk parolees for low severity violations, the Commission failed to act quickly to convert to the new system. Another issue is the Commission's habit of incarcerating people pending parole revocation hearings. If probable cause is established for an alleged violation, the Commission can detain the parolee pending his final revocation hearing approximately two months later. The Commission almost never exercises its discretion to release a person with continued supervision by CSOSA pending the final revocation hearing. Thus, any employed parolee will almost definitely lose his job, even if the violation allegations are unfounded. Of course, failure to maintain employment is a technical violation that can and does <coughs> lead to reincarceration. <coughs> After the revocation hearing, the examiner announces the recommendation. A commissioner makes the final decision without explaining any reasons for reversing the hearing examiner. The commissioners almost never listen to the audio recordings made of the hearings and do not indicate which commissioner made the final decision. The basis for any appeal to the Commission's National Appeals Board is the examiner's one-page summary of the hearing, which may not adequately reflect the proceedings and which is not automatically provided to the parolee, who must sometimes litigate the appeal without the summary. The National Appeals Board consists of three of the five commissioners. Board decisions are issued anonymously. Not only is there no way of knowing whether, as the rules require, the author of the appellate decision is different from the commissioner who made the final decision, the commission bars an objection to a board decision that the deciding commissioner was a voting member on the appeal. Not surprisingly, the board never reversed their own decisions in fiscal years 2004 and 2005 and did so in only 2% of appealed cases in fiscal year 2006. While there is much to criticize about the structure and work of the commission, some of its work is effective and appreciated, such as reducing resolution time and the use of the re reprimand sanctions hearings. We've referred to those areas in our written testimony. I appreciate the opportunity to present this testimony <coughs> to the subcommittee, and I would be pleased to work with the members in their ongoing, ongoing consideration of these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Buchanan. The chairman has had to leave for uh, a few minutes. Uh, Dr. Austin. Thank you, Congresswoman uh, Norton. Um, I'm going to give my testimony on actually the report that uh, Ms. Buchanan just referenced, which was the evaluation of the U.S. Parole Commission salient factor score. Uh, about a year ago, um, I was asked by the Parole Commission to reevaluate the extent to which the factors and the risk instrument that they were using to determine release of prisoners who have been sentenced under the old indeterminate sentencing law was accurate in terms of assessing the true risk of the prisoners, and then also look at the revocation process and the guidelines that, that govern that. Um, so what was completed was a an analysis of D.C. inmates who had been sentenced under the old indeterminate sentencing law. As you recall, under the old law, which was before the Revitalization Act, that's the way it was. You would receive a minimum and a maximum sentence. As the two gentlemen mentioned to us in the previous panel, one of them had a five to 15 year sentence. Uh, he would have to do those five years and then it's up to the parole commission to decide when they would be released. Under the old D.C. parole board, the presumption was you would be released at the minimum. Um, once that authority transferred to the U.S. Parole Commission, a different philosophy was adopted, which was there is no presumption of being released at the minimum. You have to go through this risk process and determine whether or not you're going to be released at what point of your sentence. So I'm going to summarize some of the major findings that I think are very important in terms of understanding uh, the risk that these people pose and the reasons why they're recidivating and some options that are now on the table that we hope will fix the situation in the next, I would say, six to eight months. If you look at the prisoners released in 2002, there's two things that are very striking about them. One is that their sentences compared to other inmates throughout the country, including Illinois, they have much longer sentences 
and they serve a much longer time incarcerated before they're released. To be very specific, the national average of time served across the country now is about 30 months. DC inmates under the old law are serving over 44 months. So it's about over a year longer on average. Uh, this difference in the time served for the DC inmates is not explained by the type of crime they're committing. They are serving exactly the same types of crimes that other states. In fact, if you look at the length of stay by each crime type, violent crime, drug crimes, property crimes, you'll see that DC inmates consistently serve a longer period of time than in other states. And that's because of the presumption that you do not get out at your, at your minimum release date for the old sentence law. You have to serve more time before you can get out. If you look at the recidivism rates, which is interesting, I think, uh, you'll find that about two-thirds of these prisoners got rearrested at least one time within a three-year period after being released. 52% were reconvicted and 37% were returned to custody. These rates are exactly identical to other states. So there's no difference really in the risk that they're posing. The other thing that's interesting, which is very uh, uh, similar to other states, if you look at the number of arrests that they uh, that were lodged against them before they went to prison, and then after they get released, you'll see a dramatic drop in the number of arrests, a 67% drop in the number of arrests are occurring. So although they're getting arrested, they're getting arrested on a much less frequent basis and for very less serious crimes. 87%, I'm sorry, 83% of the crimes that they're being returned to prison for are either property crimes, drug crimes, or parole and probation technical violations. Very few are coming back for a violent crime. So they're not getting worse. Um, they're getting better, so to speak. And part of the reason they're getting better is what we call the maturation effect. They're burning out, slowing down. Um, it's a national statistic that's repeated over and over again. People that are committing most of the crime in the District of Columbia are not people being released from prison. They represent a very small percent of the crime problem. The crime problem is the young generation coming up. That's the group we should be focusing on. So there's a number of people coming out of prison that pose little risk to public safety. Their problems tend to be in the area of the violation and also property and drug use. Another important finding that we found is that the length of time that they serve is completely unrelated to recidivism rates. Which means if you do 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, 44 months, you get exactly the same bang for that buck in time served. And what that tells you, the issue for us in the future is what's the appropriate amount of time to serve. It becomes extremely important in the district because you're serving such a long period of time unnecessarily. You're not getting anything for that additional 14 months that people are having to serve before they get out. The salient factor score, as, as she alluded to, uh, was imported from the Bureau of Prisons. It had been tested on a very different population. It's not the DC population, doesn't look like the DC inmates. And therefore, quite understandably, it is not a good predictor of recidivism. So the instrument that the commission is now using is not predictive, even though it's being used for such a purpose. So it needs to be fixed, and rather quickly, so we can get an instrument that does work. Now, in our analysis, we came up with a new prototype system, uh, which includes things that we know work from other jurisdictions, but more importantly, takes into account what we call dynamic factors, which are the things that prisoners can change on. So completing and participating in programs that we know reduce recidivism rates, they would get credit for that on the risk instrument. Uh, being better prepared to be released to the community, we found in our research on the DCMAs, lowered their recidivism rates. So there are some things that can be incorporated in the risk instrument that would do a far better job of reducing uh, recidivism. Uh, one other thing I just want to mention on the study, which we also found, which is consistent with the previous speaker's testimony, is that the period of time that they are serving on a violation is quite long, much longer than what you see in other jurisdictions. It, it's gotten to the point now that 
theoretically the time that you can serve on a technical violation can exceed your sentence. It can exceed your sentence for a technical violation. So you're like, I think the first speaker in the first panel was talking about he can't get off of parole. Well, he can't. It keeps on being added and added, and he'll, he'll stay on parole for a long, long time until he becomes extremely free of any violations, which is very hard to do. So based on these findings, what we suggested was that let's change the guidelines, let's get a new risk instrument, let's get it designed, and let's get going with a new system that's going to work for the district. As of this point, we have now formed a partnership with the Bureau of Prisons, uh, the Parole Commission, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice, the Public Defender's Office, um, the U.S. Attorney, and CISOSA to come up with this new instrument, this new process. And we're in the midst now of collecting the data. We hope to have the analysis done in the next three to four months, and we should be able to have a new system ready to go sometime this summer or in the fall. Um, so that's where we're headed. It's going to be a positive change. It's going to produce much better results. I think lower recidivism rates. It should reduce the amount of time that people are serving now, both uh, on their current sentences but also on the violations. So I thank you for your time, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have about this study. Well, thank you very much. and. Uh Thank you, Delegate Norton. Um, let me ask you, um, Mr. Quander, what would you consider to be the greatest difficulty that your agency faces trying to coordinate as many of the services as you can that exist for the ex-offender population? Our greatest difficulty is that there are so many needs that um, offenders coming back um, to the community have. Um, and as many of the witnesses have testified today, it centers around areas of treatment, um, housing, education, employability. And so when you try to um, coordinate, it's not just coordinating with one group, but there are various entities that are out there. That's why our strategy has been to try to coordinate not only with government offices, but also um, the faith-based um, entities and organizations that are there that can provide that assistance. It is a, a multi-layered um, approach that we have to take in order to provide the necessary services. It's not just one thing that will be impactful. It's all, and they're all intertwined. So it's just the breadth of the, um, the problem that requires a lot of coordination, a lot of dedication. Um, and that is probably the, the largest um, problem that we, that we face. Knowing that it's, it is, in fact, very difficult to pinpoint and to find all of these services, say, in one location or one place, in your experiences, is there one overriding need that must be met if many of these individuals are to experience success? It, th that again is difficult because if, if you, for example, take substance abuse and we provide substance abuse treatment and, and, and it actually takes, if a person doesn't have a place to live then it's only a short matter of time before he may revert back. If a person doesn't have a means to, um, to sustain his employment, then that individual may seek other um, illegal means to sustain his ability to, to live and to provide. So it, it is that complicated process that we're working on, and we've made a lot of improvement, but it takes a lot of coordination. Um, we do need additional uh, resources in the area of, of substance abuse to cover all of the individuals who need that intervention. But as far as housing, employment, education, those are things that we have to work just as, just as hard on to make sure that there is a sustained improvement as far as service delivery to the population. That's, that, I believe, will give us the best result in the long run. How helpful or accommodating are you finding that 
families and other people who are not necessarily part of a program are being in assisting individuals. For example, we have a system where if a person says, I've got a place to live, you may be able to get out on parole or you may be able to get out earlier. But of course, when the individuals, I mean, they'll, they'll have some place they will say they can go. But of course, they've already been told <laughs> by whoever's address that they're using that you know you really can't stay here now. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna let you put my address down, but you can't really stay here, I, I, I mean. So how successful are you finding, or, or what are you finding in terms of the willingness of families themselves to provide individuals with this most basic thing of a place to live? It, it, it comes as, as no surprise that when a crime is committed, not only is that individual um, involved in the criminal justice system, but his or her family is involved in it. And oftentimes, families have, have been uh, standing beside their loved ones for, for years. And so it, it varies. Um, many families are, are tired, but they're willing in many instances to continue working um, with um, their loved ones if they know that they have someone that's going to help them. If there's going to be a community supervision officer, if there's going to be a mentor from a church, if there's going to be someone else to help them in that process so that they don't have to take the burden on themselves. And that's been part of our philosophy. That's why we reached out to the uh, faith-based um, organizations early on, because we knew that they were in the business of, of helping individuals and had already been doing a lot of this. So we wanted to partner with them so that when that individual comes home, it's not just a family member that is there, but there is a mentor. One of the other things that we thought was important was not to wait for that process to begin until that individual actually um, hits the streets of the District of Columbia, but we used um, video equipment so that we can start matching offenders with mentors and their family members while they're still incarcerated at the Rivers facility. And the warden at Rivers was very cooperative and supportive of our efforts. So we started to build that bridge even before the individual um, left that institution and returned to the district. I think when a family member sees that there is support, that, that the individual can make it, that the individual wants to make it, and that there is support there, I think that helps that family to embrace that individual and to keep that individual um, front and center in supporting his efforts or her efforts to regain that spirit of community. Chief Forward, let me ask you, um, what external conditions are helpful when it's time for your commission to make a decision relative to parole? Are there external conditions that will help facilitate your decision in terms of determining that this is more likely to be a successful release? The first thing is, <coughs> excuse me, is programming in the, in the institution itself uh, where they provide for uh, drug treatment. Uh, when we had a uh, teleconference with the Rivers people, what we found was that they didn't have really drug treatment programs. Uh, they now will have them in June. Uh, if the person is a, a chronic substance abuser, they need drug treatment. So that when they come out, they can go into further programs that are dual diagnosis in nature that will help deal with mental illness problems in addition to, to drugs. If they're bipolar, as an example. You have to deal with that as well as the drug treatment. The opportunity to reconnect to family, I think, is at the core of all of it. If you look at the Urban League's most recent report, they talk about 50% of the households in, in black neighborhoods 
are headed by women. There are no men. So there are no role models. And so if, they, if we can reconnect people to families, they got a much better chance. There are people that I know who are successful in this town who are successful because they had a family. They fell. They were using drugs. But they had a family to pick them up. So we need the reconnection to family. And we need solid neighborhoods and communities to help support. The idea of the uh, faith-based community being participants is a very good thing because we get mentors out of it. When we look at things like that, that makes a difference. So when we do reprimand sanction hearings, the one question that I asked is, where's your family? Do you have children? Do you have a mentor? Have you been involved in the drug treatment program? And I try to look at stable housing, stable employment opportunities. We haven't sent anybody back to jail who had a job or stable, or stable housing because we believe that that's an important part of trying to make better decisions about how you handle people. And I, just if you will permit me to say one thing, uh, when Jim Austin talked about uh, D.C. population serving longer prison times, they were getting sentenced to longer prison times, you should have noted, by the court, not by, C not by C Sosa or the U.S. Parole Commission. This was the court sentencing them. And the courts have now backed away from the sentences. The times are down on substance abuse cases because we realize that these are uh, very difficult issues to deal with, very hard for us to deal with it because there are not enough treatment spots. You know, C Sosa would do a much better job if they had more treatment slots in good programs. Every program is not a good program. It is my understanding that the authority of the uh, parole commission is set to expire soon. Um, do you have any thoughts about reconstituting it or how it should be reconstituted or well, as <laughs> should it be reconstituted? As the thoughts of one commissioner not speaking for the commission or the Justice Department, I think it ought to be reconstituted. Uh, it's due to go out of business in November. I think we ought not to be operating under a system where we're uncertain as to whether the parole commission is going to exist so that we can move forward with things that we need to move forward with. We authorized the study of the parole commission because we weren't satisfied with the way things were going. With the salient factor score, we thought it was not appropriate for this federal system that we had developed to handle this D.C. population, that we needed to do something entirely different. So we authorized the study. We've now had the first meeting where we're looking at risk factors and other kinds of issues. None of this is, to me, um, rocket science about human behavior. And any of us who understand and who've had relatives who've fallen prey to this uh, understand and appreciate that, that it is very difficult to sort out what are the risk factors. And when we sit here, just to be blunt, when we sit here and we start talking about nonviolent offenders, that sounds very, very nice. But if you live in a poor neighborhood, you live in Potomac Gardens, and people are selling drugs out in front of your house, and your three-year-old daughter got to go outside, you don't want to hear that. You want to call the police. And we ought to be honest about it and be blunt about it because these poor neighborhoods are the neighborhoods who suffer disproportionately. So we have to figure out how to build crime-resistant neighborhoods so that we're not locking people up and sending them back to jail for it. I mean, when you send somebody back to jail for 12 months for a dirty urine, it's not one dirty urine. So we ought to be frank about that, too. It's not one dirty urine. C. Sosa has had a series of graduated sanctions before it gets to where they ask the parole commission to issue a warrant for this person's arrest. Um, Director Buchanan, your agency represents individuals before the parole commission who are up for revocation. <coughs> um, do your experiences suggest that there are some changes in procedures or changes in requirements um, or criteria that might be <coughs> used 
as they make decisions? And yes, sir. We agree with Chief Fullwood and with Dr. Austin that the salient factor score that the commission uses is out of date and essentially inapt for this population, mm -hmm. that there needs to be a tighter correlation between known risk factor predictors uh, or validated factors and predictors and the, uh, the grid and the sanctions available for parole um, and supervised release revocation. That's one area, uh, to, to update the grid, to update the factors, and to provide training, to institute those changes and to provide training to the commissioners in their application. Also, we are, we have a slightly different opinion than Chief Fullwood. Um, we would prefer to see the parole revocation and supervised release revocation matters go back to the original judges who are familiar with the folk whom they s sentenced and are familiar with the backgrounds and we be believe it would be more appropriate for them to resolve these issues than for the commission to do so. The commission has um, a federal mandate, a uh, federal character, and has very few ties uh, to the District of Columbia outside of Chief Fullwood. So those are just two of, two of the main, um, main issues. We also believe that the commission should be more flexible in deciding the person's release status upon the initial probable, probable cause hearing. There are, um, it is, um, there are other factors besides drug use and the gra graduated sanctions. There's the reintegration into the community. There's the, the employment, um, employment, person's employment status to consider. And these, these detentions are very disruptive to the parolee's progress and reintegration into the community, which ultimately is gonna have to happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Austin, let me just ask you one question before I go to uh, Ms. Norton. Um, it's my opinion that part of the problem with all of this is that there are so many citizens who just haven't come to grips with their own feelings about crime, punishment, what to do with it, what to do about it. Mm -hmm. um, many of the programs and program activities that people talk about, individuals believe in them, but they take what I call the NIMBY attitude about them, and that is not in my backyard. Um, it's all right to have a halfway house, but put it in Baltimore, <laughs> or take it over to Virginia <laughs> or somewhere. Don't put it <laughs> you know, in the neighborhood where I live. How do we convince the general public, uh, not just law enforcement personnel, not just professionals, not just um, judges and jurists, how do we convince the general public that what we're often talking about actually makes sense well, and is in their best interest right. as well as in the best interest of saving money or doing whatever else we say that it will be. Um, I would urge that we give them a better accurate portrayal of what the source of the crime problem is. Uh, I live in the district. I've lived in the district now for about 15 years up on Capitol Hill. Since I've been here, I've been the victim of uh, a car theft and three break-ins into my house. Um, prior to that, I lived in Chicago and got stuck up a couple of times delivering milk on the south side of Chicago. So I, I know what being a victim is. Over that 35-year period, it's the same person. It's a young male, probably about age 16 to 21. That is your target group. If you have a society or community where young males have nothing to do, uh, they don't have any meaningful employment or opportunities, they're going to find something to do and they're going to come after you. So the public needs to understand that people coming out of the prison system is the least of their worries. If you look at any prison system, when we do these population forecasts, about half of the prisoners are going to be in the Bureau of Prisons five, eight years from now are now teenagers and they're living amongst us. So that is the public safety issue. You can find communities that are very safe. You can find cities. The District of Columbia, by the way, is extremely safe in probably 80% of it. There's 20% that's very dangerous. And you'll, you can take a rocket science to figure out what's safe about those communities. 
So the public needs to understand, and it's through, I hope, you know, people like yourself, Chairman Davis, who can articulate to them that the criminal justice system is not the way to make places safer. It's other things about our society that makes us safer. The reason that we are not criminals is because we got educated, we were raised properly, we had good parents. We have something to lose if we get involved in criminal activity. So that's the trick, is flipping that whole thought process that the way to make places safer is to have a big criminal justice system. That's not the way. That's just simply mopping up after the damage has been done. Thank you very much. Um. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to understand this longer sentences uh, issue. Uh, I'm looking at Ms. Buchanan's testimony first, and because you indicate, and I'm looking at page three, that when they abolished the D.C. Board of Parole, that's parole board, uh, and these distinctions may be important to trying to understand what's happening here. At parole, we don't have parole, isn't that right, in the federal system? There's no parole anymore in the federal system, that's correct. In fact, there's no, no parole in D.C. either. It's no probation either, except the kind of supervised release that these uh, D.C. residents and, and the ones before a certain date in the federal system? No. Just clarification, there is no discretionary release to parole or parole-type supervision. Everyone still coming out of prison goes to a parole type supervision category. What's, what's changed is truth in sentencing. You get a sentence and you do a certain percent of that sentence. There's no de release decision by the Thank parole you. commission, except for the old cases, which are getting smaller and smaller. So the presumption you're talking about is the presumption that you'll serve a certain amount of time? Right. Yes. Um, uh, what I don't understand is Ms. Uh, Buchanan says, since, I guess, the abolition of the D.C. Patrol, Parole Board, you say since this last change, PDS has seen an increase in the number of supervision revocations, with a particularly profound increase in the number of revocations based on minor violations. Well, when they were on, when it was D.C. Parole Board, rather than the U.S. Uh, Commission. Correct. Mm -hmm. Was there less supervision? Why, I mean, the, the, you don't indicate why this change would have resulted in more minor revocations based on minor violations. Part of it has to do with the salient factor score system. The, D, the D.C. Parole Board did not have any, any uh, did not use that instrument in order to make parole decisions or parole revocation decisions. So, you under so what the did they use? They used their own discretion. As it's been so long, I, I actually am not sure exactly what they used. But it just sounds like the sentencing guidelines. I'm not trying to, trying to get some kind of objective system. Right. Well, the sentencing guidelines did not substantially increase the sentences that. Um, no, I'm talking about the I'm old sorry. federal sentencing guidelines. Oh, okay the ones that are so controversial <laughs> by the numbers and so forth. Um, longer sentences, are you including uh, the parole time? Are you talking about sentences that have been authorized by the D.C. Council, uh, Dr. Austin? I'm not sure I understand. No, the, where the, the, the study longer th sentences come from. The study that I did was a uh, study people who had been sentenced under the old D.C. sentencing law, which was indeterminate. So you got a minimum sentence and you got a very long maximum sentence. The new uh, sentencing structure actually, is, as uh, Mr. Fullwood has noted, is making some very positive changes. They've lowered significantly now the sentence length. So we don't know, I don't have a good read right now on how much time the prisoners are serving under the new sentencing Now the old sentencing laws were longer for what reason? Well, they, g they gave a range. So just like the gentleman said, he had a five to 10 year sentence. Okay, so he could have done 
anywhere from five to ten years. So you don't have a fixed sentence, which you get now under So a fixed sentence is better. It depends, it depends how you set it. Now, for example, in your state in Illinois, Illinois has determinate sentencing. Illinois is famous for having some of the shortest prison terms in the country right now. On average, prisoners serve about 12 to 14 months in the state of Illinois. Um, you go to the state of Michigan, just north, they serve an average of four years under determinate sentencing. So it's how you set it, it's all a math game. And the issue is proportionality of the time served to the crime that the person has committed. We know scientifically it doesn't make any difference how much time you serve on recidivism rates. Well, you say the, sen <coughs> the sentencing done today is more in line with what might be expected. Yes. As opposed to those who are serving sentencing, sentences under the old system. Well, how, what, what proportion of, of would you imagine those would be? And is there anything that can be done about them? Well, they'll probably, uh, uh, and Mr. Fulber would know, I, I would say over the next two to three years, just about all of them will have been reviewed by the board for release. Right. So say that again. Over the next two or three years, just about all the old sentence people will have been. Okay. Have so that's passing. That's Th passing yeah. through. Okay. Right. Now, Chief Fullwood said that, the, as a matter of fact, um, graduated sanctions are used before they ever get to parole viola uh, uh, revocation. But why, why then are so many of them technical? In fact, the greater number, 54% or something, are technical violations. What does that mean? What, what that means um, is that the releasing authority, the United States Parole Commission will say. The what? The releasing authority. The parole commission will release an individual under certain conditions. Um, you have to maintain employment, no drug use. Um, there are other conditions of release. And those are the conditions that an individual under supervision must follow. So when an individual is testing positive for uh, any substance um, other than alcohol, unless the, unless the parole commission specifies no alcohol, if a person is testing positive, then that's a violation of his or her condition of release. But we, as Commissioner Fool will indicate, we do not recommend revocation for one violation or two or three. Actually, what happens is if well, a person- You heard the testimony of uh, one of the witnesses before you that he was told that marijuana was not a habit-forming substance. That, that is, that's not the way that, that we um, approach um, this problem. We look at drug use um, as something that needs to be addressed. And if you're using marijuana, then there's a, there's a problem, and we want to correct that. The reason that there may be this indication of, of a greater use of technical violations is that we have to respond. You know, a technical violation let's say, get, 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 means you're not committed any crime, but right. it's a condition of to. parole. You didn't, you didn't go out and commit an offense. You didn't break the law, but you did not live up to all of the conditions that parole put on you, and therefore you're going back to prison just like those mm -hmm. who had in fact committed a crime. Except for the extent that drug use is a, a new crime. And in addition- Drug use, it is certainly true, Mr. Kwanda, mm -hmm. that you are sentencing people to jail for drug use. Mm -hmm. And that is what I thought we didn't do in this country. What I'm suggesting is not that we're sending them directly to jail for drug use. What we are doing is we are notifying the U.S. Parole Commission when a condition that they set has been violated. When we ask for a warrant or for a person to be revoked, we are asking because we have exhausted everything that we can do, but that individual is non-compliant. He's non-compliant to the sense that there is a risk to public safety because if you cannot adhere to these conditions and we do not have confidence that you're not doing some other things. So that's why we have these graduated I sanctions. See. So if you're smoking marijuana and you keep coming up with dirty urines, then we think you might be doing something else really dirty really criminal. I mean, I don't understand the relationship. What we have to do is, since it's a I can see your frustration, mm -hmm. but this is putting somebody in prison. Not, 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 necess not necessarily. The, the, the gentleman, 
the gentleman that, that, that spoke earlier, um, oftentimes it is, it is not that singular event. It, it is not the marijuana. It's something else. The other thing that it, it supports is- No, he was is, very truthful. He was very truthful. He said it was several marijuana, several dirty urines, and failure to show up for his, to his par parole officer back in the slammer. That and other- Had a job, managed to get it on his own, back to jail. And I can share with you um, the specifics of, of his case and any other case. But the issue is- He told is us, he had a lot, you know, he said 10 or 15 times the marijuana man had, of course he was told, hey, it's not habit forming. He said he had almost 15 times the dirty urine, not habit forming. And uh, he had failed to show up for his parole officer. And that's one of the other issues. When you're not reporting to your parole officer when you're scheduled, when you're not adhering to any curfew that you're supposed to have, when we're going by and checking to see if, in fact, you are working when you're supposed to be there and you're not no, there. No, you just added to it. This man had a job. You just added to it. You're not working. <laughs> you're not working. Yeah, you know, you, you can add enough things, Mr. Kwanza. I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out at what point a condition for parole should be the equivalent of a crime. And that is what it is when you put back to jail. Dr. Austin. Yeah, I just want to, it'd be useful to look at other jurisdictions. In the state of Washington, by statute, you cannot go to prison for a technical violation, by statute. So what do they do? That, what, 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 they, do it, they do anything and everything they can except send them back to prison. So, and they've been doing this for 20 years, and their crime rate's lower you know, than most of the states in the Northwest. I, the, I, I, I mean, I, one other thing I just want to add, which is very important. It starts with risk assessment. There is a group of people being released from D.C. prison, from the federal prison system, D.C. inmates, who are low risk and are never going to come back again. One of the tactics you're supposed to be doing is leave them alone. Get them off of supervision as fast as possible. If you are doing drug testing on them, monitoring them, the research is very clear on this. You make them worse. And so it so starts with the risk no, assessment. Let me get it straight. I can understand. It, uh, you know, the argument the other way would go, well, you know, the longer they're under supervision, the more likely, quote, they are to toe the line that you are after. That is not the case? No. If they're because it's really, because they're not, in fact, committing crimes. They are violating parole. Most states are moving towards shorter periods of time on parole supervision. If there's a violation, if you're low risk and you do these kinds of things, you cannot go to prison. You can have uh, sanctions imposed, you can have things moving around, but by law and by policy, you're not allowed to go back to prison because it's not proportional. The punishment's not proportional to the behavior, and that's the issue. If I could address a couple of things, C Congresswoman Norton. You ask about uh, the serving the longer sentences. Under the determinant system, a person could get a sentence of, in a range of, say, five to 15 years. There was a one-third, the, the maximum was three times the minimum sentence. And so at the presumption before the DC Parole Board was that you were eligible for parole at the completion of the bottom number, the one-third. And most people got- well, it does, I'm sorry, you'll you have to talk into that, I can't. Under, determ under indeterminate sentencing, you could get a sentence that was a range. The bottom range was one third of the top number. So a sentence for, say, um, robbery could be five to 15. After you completed the five years, first five years of your sentence, you became eligible for consideration for parole. And the DC Parole Board, using its own separate system of factors, would make release decisions. So the reason Part of the reason why we're seeing longer sentences under the determinant structure is that, is that it's the U.S. Parole Commission who is making these, these decisions and they are using, and, and the, t the salient factor score uses a different set of factors than the, the yeah, DC It policy. sounds like they're imposing a federal system on a state. They are. On, on a state prison system. They uh, are. And, and um, one of the, cons the factors that we have not talked about explicitly here, I think. On the other hand, if I could just stop you for a second. Yes. 
as I look for ways to perhaps improve this system, I'm getting into the morass about determinant versus indeterminate is just that, it seems to me. We, we've been through that. Um, we kept them from putting the federal sentencing guidelines on, on the district. And, um, now, essentially, my point is the D.C. Parole Board considered you, considered you earlier for parole. and made The whole notion of discretion. Yes. You know, to, uh, you know it, it's interesting how the whole notion of getting rid of discretion developed yes. because more privileged people um, were, were likely to benefit from this system. It's kind of had the opposite effect from what everybody wanted it to have. And so now we have a system that's so much on a grid uh, that we see atrocious results. I realize that, <laughs> that I'm working off the sentencing guide, federal sentencing guidelines, but I, I wonder if DC has, DC sentencing guidelines have any of this um, built into them as well. Have what built into them? DC had its, had, has its own set yes. of sentencing guidelines. We were yes. able to keep from taking yes. Uh, the federal sentencing guidelines. Is any of this attributable to D.C.'s sentencing guidelines? No, I don't believe so. The, the, there was the commission that created the guidelines was very careful about trying to determine what the existing practices were and not getting too far afield from them. The other point I wanted to make is I think everyone on this panel would agree that one big issue for parole revocation, supervised release revocation, especially for, for these technical violations that involve drug use, is the resources available in the community for drug treatment. And, and there's a huge challenge there. Yeah, that's we're not going to be able to do anything about child. some of these things. Right, but We can't get drug treatment for people who want it and have never committed a crime. And so I'm, I'm trying to, you know, the problem I have here as a member of Congress is I can't change the whole system. I've got to find a way to deal with an unfairness without somebody, without telling somebody, hey, up in the whole system, drug treatment on demand and everything will be hunky-dory. I also don't believe that because a lot, of the, a lot of the drug treatment doesn't even work. Just a point of clarity, I, I, the court determines when a person is going to go on supervised release. They set the date. Is that not correct? I believe so. Yeah. I mean, it's not the parole commission that sets the supervisor. You mean the initial, date. the initial? Yes. It's, it's, Your Honor, there's not, when a, when a court imposes a sentence, yes. that court gives a sentence, for example, um, 10 years for aggravated assault. Yes. Under the, the, the sentencing scheme, that individual has to serve 85% Percent. of that. So that individual knows, everyone knows that he will be eligible for supervised release in eight and a half years. Mm -hmm. And that's when that individual is going to be released. That's under the, the sentencing scheme that is in place now. Right. But of course that's not the case, is it, Dr. Austin? Because you can have, you can have, you, you lose your street time, so you can have perpetual parole. Because you can lose your street, every time you, well you lose your street time only if you go back to jail. The, the difference in, in <laughs> this, in, and we are getting into the morass of it, the, the difference in the new sentencing structure is that person has that 10-year that sentence, and if he is serving eight and a half years, all that person, all that remains is that additional period of time, that year and a half. Under the old system that Mr. Cannon was talking about, when that individual was sentenced to five to 15 years, if that individual was released after five years, then he still had 10 years to go. So even if he got to um, year 14 and then there's a new law violation and his parole is revoked at year 14, he would lose all of that time from the point when he was released. So he would lose from year six all the way up to year 14 as far as his street time. That I believe is different under the new sentencing scheme. But there are, there are still individuals who are on parole now that face that, that dilemma. Um, and I believe it was, it's the noble case or the noble decision that indicates decision. that that street time is forfeited. And, 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 and that was due to the D.C. board, when they were in existence, did not interpret the law that way, the statute itself. 
And when, when the U.S. Parole Commission got the D.C. population, they interpreted the statute differently, and the case went to court. And the court said the U.S. Parole Commission is correct in getting rid of the street time. Now, we're at the present time getting ready to meet with the, I think it's the Washington Lawyers on Civil Rights, ab about that issue. Because that's, that's clearly a place that we need to look into. Uh, my general feeling, just my personal feeling is that we should not automatically revoke people's time. That we ought to look at cases individually. What that purpose does it serve to revoke people's free time? You what put them back. Huh? <laughs> they got to start over. Now, what, what, what is so we got them for a longer period would be of time, the as Dr. Austin indicated. What would, be, what would be the rationale that they would offer those who, who came up with that system? The only, there is no scientific basis in no. terms of public safety. It, it's, it, I just want to add one other thing, which I, this may sound controversial, but there are drug users and there are drug abusers. And you have to distinguish <laughs> this, you know, that there's probably 25 million Americans that are using drugs illegally every day and they are not involved in criminal activity. So we have to make this distinction between people that use drugs Don't recreationally and then those that are abusing drugs and that's linked to their criminal behavior. Just because you test dirty doesn't mean you're at risk to go out and commit crime. And I, 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 this should be clear to all of us because we're all grown adults. We know this, but we don't act like this. We, we have a standard policy for everyone even though it's very different behavior. And, and uh, the mandatory well, drug testing. this is so-called zero tolerance. Well, <laughs> mandatory drug testing is what's causing a lot of the revocations. If you start testing everyone, you're going to bring in a lot of fish. But Ms. Quanta says, and, and we are certain that one, you have to do a lot of bad marijuana urines in order. To, and I don't know how 15 marijuana uh, urines makes you any more susceptible <laughs> to crime <laughs> than three. I mean, the fact is, you know, you like weed. I don't understand the relationship between marijuana users and crime. And that would be, the, the, that's, that's the correlation I'm looking and, for. And a parolee that starts smoking dope knows they're going to test positive over the next 30 days so they don't go in because they know they're going to test dirty. And now you've got two violations not showing up. When they do show up, they do the test. They fall off the wagon. So it does start snowballing. Well, and Ms. And Ms. Mr. Kwanda, we, it, it, I think it was in Ms. Buchanan's testimony that uh, she said somebody goes in who hadn't been going in, well, he gets arrested. <laughs> you know, he, was, he, he uh, had not been reporting. He reports and he gets arrested. Um, I don't really mean to suggest that this is done arbitrarily. Um, I, 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 my, my, I guess that is my question, though. Uh, are you, for example, you may have heard Mr. Brown now, Mr. Brown, I think, was there before you had quite the alternative sanction system you had. This man had a job. He was a plumber. He said to the parole, he had had marijuana. Uh, he didn't show up a few times. And he told the parole commission, I'm going to lose my job. Uh, and obviously he did. With such a person today, that's just would such a person today be sanctioned all the way back to prison? Excuse me? We, before we write to the parole commission, we employ these sanctions. Even before it leaves our office, we don't revoke, we don't revoke anyone at all. What we do is we supervise individuals, mm -hmm. we monitor them, we try to provide um, support and we to try to provide sanctions and guidance so that we can correct non-compliant behavior. If it appears that the individual, despite our best efforts and, and despite the documented attempts. Well, Mr. Mr. Quine, I understand the general rule. I just gave you a hypothetical. Would that man today, Mr. Brown, have in fact been sent back to prison? I understand his was in 2004. In 2007, would this man with, with 15 something marijuana, here, I'm going to tell you exactly what my hypothetical is. Um, 
rearrested in 2004 for a dirty urine test, marijuana, about 15 samples in about a three-month period, and a no-show for his meeting with his parole officer, rearrested after an, a, a warrant was issued. I'm asking you, in 2007, would this man have been rearrested? He had a job. We don't rearrest anyone. Well, he my, was. I'm asking. My, I'm, not, I'm just saying, would this man be arrested? Whether you would have put the, mm -hmm. uh, put, put, uh, you see, you understand my question. I, I, I you think, don't do I the arrest. Let me let me let me try to explain it this way. Oftentimes, when when we I'm are writing, be able to get through my questions. I understand the general principle. That's why I put a specific. Uh, if all you knew was what I just put to you, would this man be arrested in 2007? Would it be your judgment that he should be arrested in 2007? It would be our recommendation to the parole commission that some action be taken. It could be a warrant. It could be a letter of reprimand. It could be any number of yep. things that we would recommend okay, to the I parole commission. Okay, I hope I take that as a no because I told you in my hypothetical the man went back to prison and he had a job. Uh, uh, he was working at that point at Kaiser Permanente No. I'm sorry, this man had a number of different jobs. Anyway, he had a job. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm going to move on. I'm just trying to establish what it takes, what, what degree of technical violation it takes to give up if, if on a, a, a person and to consider, well, look, we don't have anything else to do. We've tried everything we can do. I wonder if it is related to the, what, you report, what you report, Mr. Kwanda, in your testimony about the average caseload. Um, it was um, you recommended to have 50. Um, you report on page 279 per officer. Yes. Um, <laughs> Ten years ago, the average was approximately 179 per officer. The national standard was, um, in general supervision, 50 offenders to one supervision officer. We're a little bit below that um, now. Um, so you don't have 50? No, we're a little bit, uh, for general supervision, we're below that now. So we're better than the national average. Uh, it, it, let, let, just let me, um, I understand that, that these things uh, do depend upon the circumstances involved. You're not suggesting, Ms. Buchanan, that these matters go to court every time there's going to be a revocation. Uh, to court, well, the, the probate, the court, going to court is the last step once the person is unsuccessful at the U.S. Parole Commission level. But our experience is that most of the violations that come to our caseload are, are technical violations. For example, yesterday. No, no, I, my question is, I thought you were suggesting that instead of going to the commission, that the oh, court sorry. that originally yes. decided the matter yes, should sorry. decide whether parole uh, yes. should be revoked. Was that, was that what you said? Yes, that's oh correct. Oh, my God. Wouldn't that be essentially throwing out the administrative process, which is always set up in order to keep the courts from being over, overloaded? Well, the option is to reestablish the D.C. Parole Board, but the idea of going to court is to ha set it up like a probation, rev probation monitoring where the judge who imposed the sentence is most familiar with the facts and circumstances leading up to whatever brings the person before the yeah, court. I'm judge. pressing this because I'm looking yeah. for a solution mm -hmm. that I could, I, I could in fact sell here. Uh, the, the, you, the, you, you say, Dr. Austin, about um, a new system that you're working on? Yes. Now, any new system you're working on would have to be approved by the Justice Department. Isn't that so? Um, no. I don't know if that's, it has to be approved by the Parole Commission, I know. Yeah. So I guess it would no, be the Department of Justice. No, I thought you meant you're working with the Parole Commission. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Chief Fullwood, could you institute a new system on your own? I believe we can. That's why we've authorized Would it then have to be approved by the current Justice Department? I don't think so. I mean, we're an independent body within the Justice Department uh, that have presidential appointee commissioners. We've authorized the study. We're now moving to try to implement um, a new salient factor score, uh, the administrative process to me is a better process. I don't think it ought to go back to judges. I don't what? think judges are any different I, I than wanted, me. I wanted yeah. to ec echo Congresswoman Norton that the current, 
the current parole commissioners are moving aggressively in the right direction and i think we need to give them some time to see what could come up with how quickly we can implement a proper system so that be my recommendation they certainly are moving and by if you think that it can and will be done administratively that is certainly the better way in putting it through i would i would hate to think that it would be done and then could be unraveled based on what administration was in power so i'm i'm looking for your advice and 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 a council on that but we'd certainly be happy to see the salient factor score system changed and my recommendation for the courts taking over is it's a parallel to the supervised release system those matters go back before the original judge as well but the supervised release would be a huge under a huge change uh, that we believe should have the kind of impact that we're talking about having and 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 you know the fact that it goes back to judges and judges are struggling with this too i mean that we shouldn't sit here and like it's something nice when they go back to judges. It doesn't. Judges are struggling with this whole thing about how to handle substance abuse cases, how to handle people who come back repeatedly. Um, you know, I've talked to judges and they say, well, I don't want, you know, this guy's been back here five times. What am I going to do? You know, they're struggling with it. And so that's why I said, as I said earlier, this is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I agree with her that there are not enough treatment beds. Uh, that people continue to come back, there are not enough treatment facilities to address this problem. And I su suggest to you that it's going to get worse as the demographics in the city continue to change. Because there's no place for them to go, unless you're going to keep putting them in Southeast. And not Capitol Hill Southeast, over on the other side of the river. <laughs> well, Buchanan can, live, I live, and Paul Quandle live. Can I make and most judges don't live in the city. This, this, this one point. Um, uh, under the federal system, the supervised releasees go back to the, the sentencing judge. Right. And, and the, the local um, court, um, once that individual is released on supervised release, mm -hmm. the supervision of that individual falls to the United States Parole mm -hmm. Commission. So the supervised releasees in the District of Columbia are supervised by the U.S. Parole, parole Commission committee. as opposed to the Superior Court judges. Right. All right, just let me finally just establish what, what, what we've established here. Uh, are almost all of the inmates we're talking about here nonviolent offenders? No, it, it, it varies. We, we have um, the full range. In my testimony, I indicated that most of the individuals who we have um, um, filed um, a request for action are at the maximum or intensive level of supervision. It ranges from your violent offender to your nonviolent <laughs> offender who has um, shown a propensity to not follow the rules and is posing a danger to the community. So it's the full range of offenders. In your judgment, are changes by the D.C. Council needed uh, to assure that uh, some of the, of, of the improvements you indicated take place? On, on the noble decision, there's a bill going to be introduced to the council, um, and I'm, I'm sorry that I've lost the guy's name. Well, that's all right. If you think that's going to happen, I would like staff to. Bill for Nacy, yeah, Phil, who was introducing a bill in the council to change the noble decision. Um, The Public Defender Service is working on that right. issue as well with Mr. Fornacy and the Washington. Sorry? The Public Defender Service is also working with Mr. Fornacy on that issue. So you do think a change in D.C. law is necessary? Yes, on the noble decision, exactly, right. yes. Um, Dr. Austin, you say that, 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 you know, the best, if you try to say you ought to, in fact, abolish a policy that's been in place. You've got to be able to say why it was put in place and why it failed. Now, um, if we deny street time, is that just an anomaly? Or was there a reason? Is there a reason in penology for? No, there's, there's no scientific basis. Where does it come it. from? I don't know. There's no scientific basis. We're the, we the only place that uh, these prisons no, are. No, other, other states used to do that, but almost I, can, I could rattle off 10 to 12 states now that are getting rid of that policy because you're just wasting huge amounts of taxpayer dollars 
trying to punish, overly punish people. It's just unnecessary. It doesn't make anyone safer. It just costs a lot of money. Yeah, I think it's just punitive. Purely punitive is th that's the motivation for doing it. You and say it's what? It's purely punitive, and the district wants has deliberately set uh, to change the law in order to counteract that. And it was a court of appeals decision that relied on a, a tangential argument to say that we had to keep the current system in place, and that's why we are working with Mr. Fornesi to change the law. What, is this the United States Court of Appeals or the D.C. Court of Appeals? The D.C. Court of Appeals <laughs> ruled that the, the D.C. Council did not effectively change the law, and that's why we're trying to go back and make that specific change with that specific intent. I'm curious about why there would be this increase in, um, in drug violations. Uh, after these, after uh, at least some of these inmates have access to the Bureau of Prisons 500 hour program, which is generally re highly regarded. Have Part of these the issue prisoners, now, we know that at Rivers they didn't have right. it. Uh, I suppose they didn't really have it even be at BOP because you got, just got the law changed. Is that right? I think, I, I'm not sure what the current status of the law is. Well, we're going to have testimony that they, 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 they have new regulations. Okay. I'm just yeah. trying to establish that one of the reasons we may have this escalation, there may be many reasons, there are more drugs in society and the like, is that since D.C. residents have been under the supervision of the Bureau of Prisons, they have not been eligible until very recently for the state-of-the-art drug program. So they go in dirty, they come out dirty. And now we're paying for it and sending them back in. Mr. I, I appreciate your, um, uh, I, your indulgence, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm trying to find my way through um, the possibility of changes here that would be lasting and quick and I have been trying by this line of question to understand what in the world happens here. So I appreciate very much your indulgence in allowing me to question these witnesses. Thank you very much. And I only have one additional question. Uh, Dr. Austin, do you have any idea as to why the D.C. sentences are longer than in other well, jurisdiction. Uh, again, just to clarify, yeah. the old sentencing structure right. is what we've been talking about. The new sentencing structure is probably uh, more in line with other states, and we need to get you and the Congresswoman a calculation of, we can do a comparison to show how they stack up. That we could do pretty easy. Uh, the Sentencing Commission has good staff, and they can provide information on that. The one thing that is different is your 85 percent requirement which right. requires them to serve a certain amount portion of that time. St your state is 50 percent. Other places it's 80 percent. Some places it's 75 percent. Some places it's 40 percent. And I'll, I'll keep telling this over and over again. You can set that percentage at any level. It doesn't have any impact on the recidivism rate or public safety. It has a big impact on your budget. So you kind of pick your medicine, whatever you want to go with. But scientifically, it doesn't have an impact on public safety it has a big impact on the size of your prison population. All right. Well, thank you all so very much. And uh, we would appreciate your testimony and your indulgence and uh, your excuse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Our next witness, of course, for panel three is uh, Mr. George Snyder. 
who has served as the warden of Rivers Correctional Institution since 2003. As warden, Mr. Snyder is responsible for the administration, operation, and correctional training of offenders at Rivers. Um, warden Snyder, thank you so much for being with us. And if you would stand and raise your right hand, it's the tradition that all witnesses be sworn in. Do you swear that uh, what you're about to testify to is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will show that the witness answered in the affirmative. Of course, you've done this so many times. If you would just go ahead and proceed uh, with your five minutes, uh, then we'll get into some questions and answers. Thank you, uh, Chairman Davis and uh, Congressman Woman Norton. My name is George Snyder, Warden of Rivers Correctional Institution, located in Winton, North Carolina. On behalf of the GEO Group, I thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the various pre-release programs offered to inmates housed in our facility. As a result of the National Revitalization Act of 1997, on March the 7th, 2000, the Federal Bureau of Prisons signed a contract with the GEO Group to design, build, finance, own, operate, and manage a low-security adult male facility in Winton, North Carolina. We received our first DC inmates in March of 2001. Located on a 257-acre track in rural Hereford County, the facility is a campus design with four housing buildings, indoor and outdoor recreational areas, a central programs building, a prison industries building, and an administrative building. The design enables cost-effective utilization of security staff supplemented by modern electronic surveillance, which in turn allows enhanced programming activities without significant budgetary implication. Our average inmate population is 1,350, with approximately 65% of the inmates coming from the District of Columbia. Rivers Correctional Institution is 226 miles from Washington, D.C. Because of time constraints, I would like to briefly review some of the programs that we have at our facility, which we feel the subcommittee has the most interest. Our psychology department provides individual and group psychotherapy to those inmates who are court ordered to participate in treatment, who are referred for treatment by facility management staff or who volunteer for, to participate in the treatment. Since Congresswoman Norton's visit to our facility and since the last subcommittee hearing, RCI began preparation for implementation of its nine-month residential drug treatment program. The program will provide a continuum of treatment services to inmates with a documented history of substance abuse programs and will be conducted within a highly structured regimen of a modified therapeutic community comprised of inmates with similar problems living and working together. In addition to programming incentives, eligible inmates rate may receive up to one year off of their sentence for successful completion of the program. The following actions have been taken toward implementation of the program. As Congresswoman Norton mentioned, the, the Bureau of Prisons has been very diligent recently and they approved and budgeted for this substance abuse program. Since their approval and budgeting, we have advertised that we've got vacancies for three drug abuse specialists and one drug abuse program coordinator have been advertised in a variety of formats through the radio, internet, and newspapers in Virginia and North Carolina. Offers have been made and accepted for two drug treatment specialists. Training has been conducted for facility staff regarding the drug abuse programming and inmate eligibility requirements. Approximately 25 inmates from the general population have completed application for entrance into the program. And we have expanded the office space for the drug treatment staff in the inmate housing unit area and it's nearing completion. Full implementation of the program is scheduled to begin May the 1st. When we discuss pre-release programs, we must address 
or unit management concept. Upon entry into the facility, inmates are assigned to a housing unit and once in a unit assigned to a unit team. These unit teams manage the inmates' needs throughout his stay at the facility. In unit management, release preparation begins the very first day of incarceration and continues until the inmate is released or transferred. The re this release preparation may include one or more of the following vocational and educational programs that we have. We have English as a second language, adult basic education, general pre general education development, general education development, or commonly GED, keyboarding, computer technology one and two, life skills and parenting, and uh, a release preparation program. I just want to spend a moment to talk about this, this program. This program provides life skills that prepare inmates to reenter the community. The core curriculum is organized into six broad categories, health, nutrition, employment, personal finance slash com uh, consumer skills, community resources, release requirements, and aspects of personal growth and development. This intensive course covers a variety of topics, each chosen to strengthen the individual's chances for successful reentry into society, and it mirrors what the Bureau of Prisons offers. We also have a vocational woodworking technology program, and one of our most successful programs has been the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning program. Uh, of course, we have the workforce transition program, which we began this last year, and that's been in collabor collaboration with the University of District of Columbia and C. Sosa. And I'd just like to take a moment to, to comment on C. Sosa. They have been a wonderful partner in all of our collaborations and trying to come up with programs that truly work for the needs of the inmate. And I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Quander and his staff. Uh, but this program work is a work readiness program that prepares the individual's inmates to address workforce needs and marketable skills. And since the last hearing, we have begun preparation for a building construction technology program. This program, as with the uh, drug program, is scheduled to begin in May of 2008. The Building Trades Program will be certified through the National Center for Construction Education and Research using the nationally recognized Wheels of Learning instructional materials and will be taught by certified instructors from our local community college, Roanoke Chowan Community College. The program will accommodate 45 inmates per a 16-week semester. At the completion of this program, the inmates will be certified and will qualify for entry-level employment in the construction industry. I would uh, like to state that Mr. Brown uh, stated that we had the HVAC program, but there was an age restriction on that from age 18 to age 24. And uh, there is only one criteria for this new building construction program that we have, and that is that the inmate will, must have at least six months left on his sentence. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my summation of a few of the programs that we offer at Rivers, and I look forward to answering any questions that you and uh, Ms. Norton may have. Thank you very much, and uh, again, we appreciate uh, your indulgence and um, your being here. Let me ask, when did uh, Rivers get its contract? It was in two th uh, 2000, as the original contract was in March of 2001. 2001. Yes, sir. Do you have any data relative to inmates who have been released and who may be reincarcerated? No, sir. We, we, don't, we don't track that data. And I'm so it would be pretty difficult to determine the effectiveness of some of the programs relative to recidivism reduction, that is determining whether or not the individuals have gotten out and whether or not they've come back or they've been reincarcerated or still experiencing the same problems that they may have experienced before. That would be difficult, yes, sir. Um, yeah, I wish that, you know, I think that's something that we need to begin to look at 
in terms of um, individuals who are incarcerated so that we can tell, I think, or have a better handle on, on whether or not at least that component of what it is that we're doing is being effective. Um, given the, the population that comes from the District of Columbia, um, which areas of need do you think exist the most? I'm, I'm saying there are some individuals who come in who probably need uh, anger management. Um, there are some individuals who just barely can read and write, uh, who need uh, general education development. There are some individuals who maybe can do that, but they don't have any specific skill that they can make use of. Uh, is there any area of greatest need that you've been able to determine? I don't have any data to back this up, sir, but I would feel that the job preparation, it's so very difficult because uh, for someone getting out of prison to succeed and then to uh, having a job, uh, certainly uh, I think some data nationally would show that, that uh, job preparation would be probably the greatest need that people would have. Yeah, I, I would agree with you because it seems to me that no matter what else is going on in a person's life, if they can't find a job, if all of these work barriers continue to exist, then in all likelihood we can expect a good number of them to end up back, if not at Rivers, someplace else. Uh, because the same circumstances that got them there in the first place pretty much continue to exist in their lives unless somehow or another that has not been corrected. Um, the other question that, that I would have, I mean, I like the idea of the psychotherapy, the drug um, treatment. Uh, one of our witnesses testified um, about receiving 12 cents an hour yes, sir. for work. Um, as a person who's inside and, and who comes in contact with uh, the thinking of inmates and with staff, um, what's the reaction overall to that? Is, is that something that inmates moan and groan about? Is it something that they find distasteful? Is it something they complain about? Is it something that maybe helps to develop negative attitudes rather than positive attitudes when they ultimately get out? Uh, concerning the attitudes and getting out, I'm not sure about that, but I can comment on how they feel when they're in. Many of we try to tier their pay. There are some jobs that pay higher, lo lower than that, some pay higher than the 12 cents. It may go up to 14 cents. and we. And we try to mirror it after society. Those that have an education would get the higher pay, lower education. That we try to encourage them, for example, to get a GED. To get the highest pay grade level, you have to have a GED or have an ex exemption to the GED for some reason. So we try to mirror it. That is a, is a contention with inmates is the pay rates. But, but our pay rates mirror the Bureau of Prisons pay rates. We try to keep our operations very similar to the Bureau of Prisons because we have inmates that transfer from Bureau facilities to our facilities, so we try to keep them very similar. So there is a concern about the pay rate, but that, and I've been doing this for 28 years now, and it's always a concern, and it's similar uh, concern that people have in society. They like more money for their work, so. 
All right, thank you very much. Yes, um, ma'am. Delegate Norton. Well, Mr. Chairman, this was very straightforward testimony. I have only a few questions because this is in the nature of a status report, the kind of status report I must tell you that members of Congress committees like ours like to hear, progress. And I do want to, to say to you, Mrs. Snyder, you will find me and I believe the chairman and the entire subcommittee is likely to, to, uh, to be as quick to commend as to criticize. And as I said in my opening testimony, uh, you deserve uh, credit given our last hearing, given our trip, and so does Mr. Lappin. And I said, of course, in, at that hearing that you were not funded to do right. the equalization, as I called it, of services. And so that took um, Director Lappin's intervention, and he, he was quick to do, to do so. So I, I want to just say for the record how much we appreciate the straightforward way you moved uh, ahead. Now, the program that you are building a facility, drug, uh, drug rehabilitation program, you can see how, how much that would mean to the District of Columbia when you hear that people get sent back to rivers and, uh, because chiefly of some kind of minor infraction, particularly drug abuse, we understand perhaps upwards of 70 percent of these offenders now. I don't know how many of them have had access because it only started to the 500-hour program. So it will be very interesting for us to trace whether or not now that we're going to have the 500-hour program available in BO, excuse me, BOP facilities in that rivers, whether that has an effect upon these drug re revocations. Um, um, the importance of the 500-hour program, I see it, is that they reinforce one another because they live together, yes, and they have an incentive that if they complete the program satisfactorily, uh, they could get as much as a year reduced from their sentence. Is that, is that true? Or that what? is correct. If, yes, you, they can receive up to one year off. Now, if you're looking for an incentive, it seems to me that <laughs> that's the, that is the the paradigm for an incentive. Uh, the chairman asked about uh, trying whether or not there was in a, any system for tracking essentially whether these programs work like the new programs you're putting into effect. I do believe that the Bureau of Prison has a, has a strong reputation for in fact doing control studies or doing studies all the time. And particularly since Rivers is just starting <laughs> with these new programs, uh, I must ask you whether you know uh, if the Bureau of Prisons intends to track uh, your programs to see if there is any difference, for example, as the chairman says, whether there's more recidivism when people have had access to programs and when they haven't. Do you know of any such plan? I I don't know that they're going to do it. I think they may have the mechanism in place already and just to apply it to these inmates. But uh, I can certainly find that out and get back with the I know the, the Bureau of Prisons has lower recidivism rates than most state prisons, and I think they, th this is something that staff will want to track. Here we have a tabula rosa almost here. Right. It's uh, ready-made for somebody to track and see what makes a difference. And that's the only way you can know how to improve, how, what to continue, and the rest of it. Um, now, May 1st is when? That's a target date to begin, begin both of the programs. And you're on target so far? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Are all the... You, you've testified that the drug program, drug rehabilitation program, is comparable, is the 500-hour program that they yes. have at, at other BOP facilities. Um, are all of the other programs uh, that you have testified about also comparable to the BOP programs, building construction technology, for example? Building construction technology, that program is designed by requirements that the Bureau of Prisons have given us in a statement of work. They said we w want this type of program that certifies and uh, by, uh, would be a certain length and so 
I assume that it meets it meets their requirements of what they're looking for. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I just want to note that what's uh, we, we well m maybe I should ask about the HVAC program first. I was a little concerned about the HVAC program. Not that this is not exactly the kind of of um, skill that's likely to be used, um, but then there are all kinds of of issues about being employed, particularly if 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 you work in people's homes and so forth. Um, I, I note these uh, construction um, industry, uh, these construction industry, uh, this construction industry training you are engaged in, in here now. Not only does it seem to me to be this is, well first let me just say for the record, if you talk to people in the construction trades, they will tell you that although the rate of pay remains what it always was, very high rate of pay, the co that people who might have gone into construction no longer do. That, you know, th they'll, they'll go fool with some computer somewhere. Uh, thus, we have found that it's easier to get people hired in the construction trades today. They will take uh, ex-offenders in the construction trade. There is a job shortage there. So I must say I'm pleased to see such things as roofing, exterior, siding, basic residential plumbing, um, uh, drywall, because, uh, and of course we had some discussions with you, but what I think you've done is to, to look at where there's a market, uh, where there is a need, and I believe you have hooked up with what, where, where the need is in this, um, in, in this region. Now, you heard Mr. Brown, perhaps, you were here when he testified that for HVAC, there was a age limit. And although he's a young man, he couldn't get into the program. It, it, uh, um, is that because of the trade, uh, the, the trade uh, itself requires that for apprenticeship training and the like? The HVAC requirement on the age of 18 to 24 was because it was a, a State Department of Education program that was a grant program that was uh, it was tied to the that specific is it, age. Is it still uh, is that program still going on? It's still going on and it's it's functioning well. Actually, m many inmates are paying for it themselves now. now oh you know, an inmate could enroll in it if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. I have an amendment in the Higher Education Act to try and take that age restriction off. Oh, thank I don't you. Know whether or not and the extent to which it's going to be done, but we do have an amendment mm -hmm. in higher ed to try and make that happen. The chairman's on that committee, the education committee. Thank okay. You. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, wh what about um, these other certified building trades programs? Is there any age limit on them? There's no restrictions whatsoever other than the inmate must have at least six months remaining on a sentence to to qualify to enter the program. Because you need time to. It needs time, at least six months, to uh, finish part of the program. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Snyder, Warden Snyder, I recall that many of those who were at Rivers were essentially parole revocations when I visited. Is that still the case? It's, there's still quite a few. Yes, ma'am. Would you say, w they had also seen, Rivers also seemed to be a place where people transitioned from other BOP facilities. Would you describe roughly the proportions? Just roughly. And this is just a guess because yeah. I have no data to support this that I would say 50% of them, may, maybe as high as 50% could be parole revocations. Maybe 40% 40, 40 maybe. I, I'm not for sure. Mm -hmm. I don't have that data with me. Um, you mentioned UDC. What is the involvement of UDC, please? University of, of the District of Columbia. Did you mention the University? Yeah, the University of District of Columbia. They're, they work on a workforce transition program in conjunction with C. Sosa, and it's a work readiness program. They come in and do a battery uh, assessment on the inmate, and actually. Actually, after they do the assessment of, on the inmate, after the inmate is released, he transitions to the University of District of Columbia for an uh, aftercare program with the district. So how, we many have such, how many inmates have 
have gone through that program and then gone on to the University of the District of We've Columbia. got our first cohort, I, I guess you could call it, that's right now getting, that has been released and that the district will be working with. And we'll, we'll be starting another group where they'll be coming into our facility. So, so, I'm sorry, so when they go to UDC, what are they doing there? They're, it's my understanding that they're, they're uh, the next step in job readiness, job training of some type. I would, I, 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 I see my associate friends are here. I think it's, uh, I, I can't understand why there is not a long distance college course or course of some kind between, I'm talking about by video, between our state university, the University of the District of Columbia and Rivers. Rivers. I just don't understand it. Um, would there be any impediment, any, re any reasons not, but not to do that? The, the majority of our inmates are there for less than a year, I guess. And, and yeah, the, you go to school for nine months. Well, I, yeah. I, and I, and I, agree, I agree with you on that, Congresswoman. But I guess finding a commonality of a course that all of them are, would take if it's, a, if it's an academic course. Well, uh, something uh, that remember certainly UDC be is to. not simply a place where people go to become doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs. Um, it is it's a combination junior college and full-fledged university. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I, again, this is something I think I'm gonna have to work on. Representative Norton, yes, I'm gonna run and vote. This is actually, those others have been motions to adjourn. This is a uh, motion on tabling the ruling of the chair. And so I'm gonna go and vote on that. But Well, um, one of the few ways in which the District of Columbia perhaps benefits <laughs> from my not having to vote is that at least witnesses don't have to <laughs> wait until I return from voting, unless it's the Committee of the Whole, and this is not, but this is a very important vote for the Chairman to, to go to. He says I could proceed with the next witness when we're through, and I'm almost through here. Um, um, but assuming that, and I must tell you, I can think of the kinds of UDC courses I have in mind, assuming that there was a UDC course of some kind, whether it's in the present curriculum or not, um, would the facilities at Rivers, would, would you be amenable to a video course uh, offered from the District of Columbia to people uh, who would take the course at uh, Rivers in preparation perhaps for the next step when they get out? Most assuredly. Anything that we can do to, to help, and we've, we've been, like I said, had, had good partnership with C. Sosa, and if we can come up with something else, we'd, we'd certainly be open to it, yes. Well, let me just say, I get the idea from what C. Sosa has done. I think the, the C. Sosa has begun in the right place. Let's get people ready for a job. I must say I was impressed by the fact, at least your own people, uh, Warden Snyder, told me that many of the DC inmates were articulate and intelligent and ready to move on, had indeed had uh, some good amount of education. We just had one witness here who graduated from McKinley High School. To the extent that we could even encourage people to begin uh, college, uh, even if you have only one year of college today, you are <laughs> way above um, w where you would have been without any college at all. Um, so um, the, the, uh, the, those were all the questions I have, and I very much appreciate your, your coming. Thank you very much. What's that? What's data? Uh, the next, the, the
the last panel is Chief, Chief Judge Rufus King, Superior Court of the District of Columbia, and Betty Bollister, JD, DC Superior Court for our Lawyers Association. Would you please stand so you may be sworn? Thank you. Do you do, do what? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, I have to stand too? Okay. Do I have to raise my right hand? <laughs> Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. The record will show that each witness answered in the affirmative. Judge King. Good afternoon, Congresswoman Norton. Uh, and uh, for the members of the subcommittee, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today on the need to restore the Superior Court of the District of Columbia bench to um, 61 associate judges and a chief judge. I am Rufus G. King III, Chief Judge of the Superior Court. Uh, I think it is S550 which has come over. Uh, would take the Superior Court to the number of judges that were authorized with the passage of the Family Court Act of 2001, that is, 62 judges, including its chief. This number is needed to ensure that all divisions of the court, not just the Family Court, have an adequate number of judges so that cases are handled fairly and expeditiously, that needed interventions can occur, and that our strategic performance standards are met. Am I, am I, I'll, I'll bring the microphone closer, sorry. According to the National Center for State Courts, the District of Columbia Courts have among the highest caseloads per capita and per judge in the nation. Since the Family Court Act became law in January 2002, and of course I know uh, Congresswoman Norton, you're well familiar with that as you played a critical role in that legislation, the number of cases pending in the Superior Court has risen by 30 percent. The court needs additional judges to properly manage this caseload, and there are several reasons. Recently, courts across the country have adopted a problem-solving approach to cases. In those courts, judges take on the task of not only resolving cases by trial or plea and a traditional sentence, but also establishing and supervising referrals of defendants to appropriate service providers. Indeed, this move goes much to what you've been discussing all afternoon. The goal is to address the issues underlying criminal behavior, such as drug dependency, homelessness, mental illness, and chronic unemployment, in order to reduce recidivism. Thus, in minor criminal cases, instead of a relatively efficient trial and closure by acquittal or sentence, the case results in an extended period of supervision while the defendant undertakes drug treatment, counseling, or other appropriate services, during which the defendant may appear before the court a number of times. At the Superior Court, we use these tools in our DC and traffic community court, which handles minor misdemeanors and traffic offenses, our East of the River Community Court, which handles all misdemeanors except domestic violence assaults uh, from wards seven and eight of the city, our drug court, which handles nonviolent felony and misdemeanor drug offenses. Our juvenile drug court, which is the drug court for young offenders. Our family treatment court, which provides drug treatment for parents without breaking up the family. And our pilot mental health court initiative, which handles cases where mental health issues are predominant. These cases take more time to resolve, but the solutions reduce recidivism uh, and thus, ultimately, uh, will benefit both the court and the community 
uh, and hopefully in reduced uh, recidivism rates. Also, pursuant to its second five-year strategic plan, the Superior Court is implementing performance standards for each of its caseloads. Performance stand standards establish timelines within which cases should be resolved and thus provide a measure of how well we are doing and where we can improve. There are other measures such as age of pending caseload and trial certainty that do go to the same goal. We base our performance standards on what we have learned from courts across the country and we seek to replicate those practices here. We have engaged in a rigorous strategic planning process designed to ensure that we're doing all we can to meet community needs, to be accountable to the public we serve, and enhance public trust and confidence in the judiciary. The additional judges called for in this bill would greatly enhance our ability to meet and in the future exceed those standards. As to the costs of the additional judges and staff, we are not asking for additional funding. Appropriations for the implementation of the Family Court Act provided funding in our base budget for the court to add judicial officers to handle family cases, raising the number of judges on our bench to 62. As you may be aware, when judges left the Superior Court and the size of the bench fell back down to 59, the Family Court Act limited us to only replacing family court judges unless the total number of judges fell below 59. The family court funding has enabled us to fully fund the family court, both judges, necessary staff, and uh, several one-time programmatic costs. Uh, if, as an example, our drop-in centers for juvenile offenders, where I believe uh, you may have been present for the opening. As federal agencies do, the D.C. courts strive to end the fiscal year with at least a 1% reserve designed to cover costs that become due after the close of the year, such as late invoices or utility expenses or contractual services performed at the end of the year. The court also experiences a vacancy rate among full-time employees, uh, including sometimes judges, uh, typical of the federal agencies, which is around 3%. Given the reserve and our typical personnel vacancy rate, we will be able to meet the cost of the additional judges and their staffs without an increase in the personal services line of the Superior Court's appropriation. The Superior Court intends to continue to manage its budget effectively and use the strong fiscal controls that have resulted in independent accountants giving us uh, their unqualified financial audit rating, uh, the highest possible rating, for the past several years. I have conveyed to staff on both sides of the Hill, authorizing and appropriating, that the costs of these, for these additional judges will be met using existing Superior Court funding levels. Uh, there will be no additional funds requested for appropriation. Um, Congressman Norton, members of the committee, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to testify today and to talk about the Superior Court's caseload figures and the need for additional judges. I appreciate your support for our efforts and look forward to working with you to ensure that the Dis District of Columbia continues to have one of the strongest trial courts in the country. I would be pleased to answer any questions. We'll hear next from uh, Ms. Ballister. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Woman Norton, for allowing me to speak on behalf of the two 2008 hourly rate increase for D.C. Criminal Justice Act and Council for Child Abuse and Neglect Program Attorneys. I am the president of the Superior Court Trial Lawyers Association, which represents more than 350 attorneys who practice criminal law and traffic law in the District of Columbia. Today I'm also speaking on behalf of more than 350 members of the CCAN panel. The attorneys who represent the indigent in the District of Columbia are dedicated to their work and proud to be part of the Superior Court of the District of Columbia. The court has supported us um, very strongly over the years and we appreciate that. Each of us on both the CCAN and the CJA panels was chosen after an application process reviewed by a committee of judges and in some cases a committee of peers. We believe that the indigent in the District of Columbia are entitled to competent representation. In March of 2002, 
we received an increase in the hourly rate from $50 per hour to $65 per hour. We have received no increases in pay since that time. Inflation has continued since that time at a rate of 3 to 4 percent a year, and the cost of goods and services has continued to rise. $65 an hour in 2002 would be between $76 and $78 an hour today, and that is a conservative estimate. We are asking that the hourly rate be raised to $80 an hour and that the limit on cases be raised to $2,400 for misdemeanor cases and $4,600 for felony cases. The increase to $80 an hour would keep us on a par to what we received in 2002. We are also asking that this subcommittee make this increase effective as soon as possible. The money has already been appropriated. None of the attorneys who practices within the CJA or CCAN system receive any benefits. Each attorney pays for all of his or her insurance costs, including health, disability, life, home, and malpractice. Each attorney pays for his or her office expenses, including rent and utilities. Each attorney pays for all of his or her supplies, including research services, computer services, and any office help. Each of these attorneys pays for his or her transportation expenses, including the continuing rising cost of gasoline. None of these attorneys has any paid vacation or sick leave. Many of these attorneys are striving to send children to college and striving to maintain the stability of homes. The attorneys of the CJA and CCAN panels deserve a raise to $80 per hour. Oftentimes, they work more than 12, 10 to 12 hours per day. They also work most weekends. They visit jails and out-of-state penitentiaries. They visit children who are placed in institutions or homes in other jurisdictions. They visit crime scenes, search for witnesses, and often find themselves in dangerous neighborhoods. They do this all to adequately and competently represent their clients, whether they be adults or children. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak, and I would be glad to answer any questions you may have. You can go right ahead. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could I ask you, Judge King, you say on page two of your testimony that the District of Columbia has one of the highest caseloads per capita and per judge in the nation. And I thought I heard you say something about a 30 percent increase. Did you say that? Yes. Uh, when, was that, uh, when was that increase? Over what period of time? Is Over a period of time, from 2002 until um, 2007 was the period. What accounts for such an increase? Measured. Um, the things that we're talking about, the greater complexity of the cases. Yeah, but I can understand that, but you said increase in case law. I, in fact, I'm very sympathetic to what you say about yes, judges, yes, in fact, doing more than uh, meeting out sentences or the rest, but in fact, doing some supervision themselves, but I thought you were talking about a 30 percent increase in cases. No, well, there's a distinction between um, pending cases, which is what I referred to, and, and that's, the, that's the number we have to deal with, uh, and filings, which are not, which are actually down a little bit over that period. We're not talking about uh, 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 filings. We're talking about cases that stay on the docket because of the involvement of judges that's in correct. these cases. That's correct, and that, that number has gone up for the reasons that I've outlined. And you must have 15 on the family court, is that right? Pardon? You must have 15 on the family court, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And, and indeed, the um, proof of that, uh, the, the wisdom of that provision has been that our family court has uh, really been able to provide much better service and, and more current service in those cases. And that's the whole yeah. reason we were able to get the overall uh, it, it, exactly, it, it paid off. for the entire court. Could I ask, um, what is the status of this bill in the Senate and the status of funding in the Senate? Uh, the, well, the funding is, is done. There is no additional funding need uh, for us. And, and as I say, I've analyzed, I asked uh, our financing people to assure me that this wasn't something where I'd have to come back next year and say, wait a minute. Um, we, we now need the funding. Th that's not the case. I, uh, we have, uh, on, on the basis of the margin of error that we work on uh, from year to year, 
and on our vacancy rate, which is borne out by long experience, we will be able to meet this obligation without additional funding. Uh, as to the status of the bill. You know, I don't see why you weren't able to meet it right if that's the case. Uh, why aren't you able to meet it right now on the basis of the vacancy rate? But I'm sorry. If that's the case, why aren't you able simply to bring these, you, because you can't go above 59? Is that we're not saying? allowed to go, this we're, this, we're just asking for, uh, to take out the, actually it, the way the law is written now is it says 58 judges and a, a chief judge. And we're just asking to change that number 58 to 61. Because so that it would authorize us to do that. That's exactly right. Now you do uh, I learned the uh, S550 has passed the Senate and has been sent to the House. So it should that's be. That's this bill. Yes, mm -hmm. that's this bill. That's correct. Um, I, I understand CBO has looked at this Congressional Budget Office. Um, and I know you understand <laughs> that if it somehow the vacancy rate wasn't what it has traditionally we are been. We are aware that the uh, CBO has, has uh, I, I think it's scored it at about a million dollars, which is a figure we're well aware of. That is, that is an but accurate. But you say um, DC courts strive to end the fiscal year with at least 1% budgetary reserve designed to cover costs that become due after the close of the year. I experience is only a portion of this reserve is typically used. How much of the reserve is typically used? It varies, but it's usually not, uh, I don't know, do we have a sense of that? I, I can well, give you I more detail. I know the, that there's a One thing a you don't want to get into is over-obligation. That's right, a uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm, of course, we don't want to do that, and, and, and I'm assured that we won't. That we, will, we will find. Uh, I, I, I favor this bill. I must say, um, and you say it's based on long experience looking at vacancies. What do you mean, since you've been the superior, you've been in superior court for about 30 years or uh, yeah, more. not quite that long, but yes, since certainly since uh, 1971 when I was admitted to the bar and began practicing in the court, uh, there have always been um, some vacancies, some vacancies among the judges, in, indeed. Because you do recognize that if there weren't this over here, we are on uh, uh, a pago. <laughs> yes. I, I and th therefore it would... This, this depends entirely on your not over obligating funds uh, on if you find yourself in, in a bind, you're taking it out of something else. Yes. Uh, because you are now annualizing, um, you would be annualizing, um, what, three more judges? Yes. With, really? all that, with all that that implies in terms of their benefits, in terms of their salaries, and That's all that right. that manages. It, it's, it's about a million dollars, and, and we have assessed it uh, on that basis. And, and I fully understand, of course, the, the uh, House, especially because you're on PAYGO, needs to know that you're not going to hear from us again on this subject uh, if, we, if this bill is passed. Well, I'm certainly for this bill. Ms. Ballast, I'm for this bill, y your bill as well. Um, <laughs> don't quite understand why it matters to Congress that each attorney pays his or her, her own office expenses. That's what lawyers do. Uh, pays for his uh, own supplies. Nobody who has somebody on a retainer, which is essentially what you'd be paid for those supplies. Um, none of these have any paid vacation or sick leave. What lawyer in private practice does, unless the firm allows that, so I, you know, you make a case, but I'm not sure why anybody who is um, seeking business with the government <laughs> ought to um, point out their rent utilities and the rest of it. Well, uh, I think what I'm, I'm trying to say, um, Congresswoman, is that we're, we are not employed by firms. And um, we do well, not. Well, some of you may be, mightn't you? No. Um, all of us are self-employed. Um, we may have partnerships, but there, I think there are well, only Well, all lawyers have partnerships, usually. No. Most lawyers do not work for a corporation. They work for a partnership. The reason I'm clarifying this is I would not want it to be on the record here uh, that somehow uh, we believe that expenses beyond what it takes 
to fairly fund attorneys for representing the indigent should be taken into account. And to the extent that the record looks like we are saying that transportation expenses and the rest of it, I recognize if you want a firm, a partnership, maybe you build that into overhead. But this, this of course, has never been the case with, with respect to um, lawyers who the government gives gives um, cases on a uh, on 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 the basis of indigency. So you are talking about uh, payment for services rendered, are you not? Payment for services rendered, yes, indeed. Um, and um, the chief judge has just indicated to me, and and I would the federal rate now for indigent. Um, attorneys in the District of Columbia has gone up to $100 per hour for um, services and, and actually up to $120 per hour in capital cases. Um, we obviously don't have any capital cases in Superior Court. However, we do have the same um, type of cases in Superior Court as there are in Federal Court. Um, we do um, believe that the $65 an hour is no longer um, a viable figure and and we just think that with the money that has been appropriated eighty dollars an hour is a reasonable figure to ask well I couldn't agree with you more Ms. Ballas when you consider what lawyers command for <laughs> sitting in their <laughs> offices these days you're doing very serious work I just wanted to make it clear some of my friends on the other side can say we're paying your transportation expenses or for your filings uh, or vacation or sick leave um, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Those are, those are my questions. Thank you very much, and I certainly think there's a big difference between 80 and 800, so I don't <laughs> I, I <laughs> make 800, and so I certainly don't have a problem with that. But let me just ask you one question, uh, Ms. Ballester. Uh, as president of the um, Superior Court Trial Lawyers Association, what would you consider to be the greatest difficulty of, of working with the D.C. courts? Working with D in D.C.? Mm -hmm. I think probably what some of the people who testified earlier, the lack of programs for indigents um, in the district, um, especially effective drug treatment programs because drug drug abuse is by far one of the biggest scourges in, in this city and I think drives an awful lot of crime in the city. Uh, Judge King, um, do you project there to be an increase for of need for judges in D.C. say over the next uh, five to ten years? What uh, what we have uh, experienced, and we actually had to look at this in terms of our building program. We're in the middle of a 10-year building program. And historically around the country, um, caseloads ebb and flow. It's a cyclical uh, situation. Uh, we went way, way up in the late 80s and early 90s. Then it leveled off. It's trending downward a little bit at the moment, back up again in some of the family cases. And so over five or ten years, I would expect a cyclical pattern with a slight general trend upward. Uh, that seems to be our historical experience, and that's what I would project. Yeah, I, I know that my good friend uh, Tim Evans, Judge Evans, is the chief judge of the largest unified court system, I guess, in the country, which is the Cook County and um, I see Tim from time to time, and we may run into each other at church and whatever, and um, he's always trying to figure out if they've got enough judges. I, I'm sure. Please uh, give Tim my cordial regards when you see him. I've, I've been well acquainted with him and have a good friendship with him as well. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Tim and I served in the city council together, and. Uh, we both left the city council about the same time, almost the same time. So uh, uh, I will make sure that I do that. I, I've always I've just enjoyed him and had the highest well, esteem for him. 
Thank you. I favor both of these bills, quite frankly. And, thank you. Uh, I want to thank both of you again for your indulgence, for your patience, and for being our last witnesses for the day. <laughs> so thank you so much, and uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much, uh, thank you. Chairman Davis, Congressman Norton.